For my 31st birthday, my friends got me a heritage DNA test. One of those where you send a sample and get an approximate percentage of what makes up your background. I don't think there was anything in particular that made them gift it to me though. I think they ordered one for themselves and got a two for one kind of deal. Still, I figured it'd be fun to check out. My biological grandpa died when my dad was very young and my grandmother remarried long before I was born. So, I was never told a lot about that side of the family. I'd always been a bit of a sickly kid. So, I've been wary about looking too closely at my family and health history. But I figured this couldn't hurt. So, I filled out the form, provided this sample, and sent it on its way. Then, I just sort of forgot about it. When I finally got the results, it came with a few surprising revelations. While the majority of my heritage was entirely predictable, there was an 11% splash of something called Northern Scandinavian Blue Hill Tribe. I asked my parents about it. While my mother had no idea what the Blue Hill Tribe was, she was pretty sure it wasn't from her side of the family. My dad was equally confused. Sure, he didn't know much about his biological father, but he knew for a fact that the man was from Oklahoma. His mom, on the other hand, was Minnesotan. Dad got curious and ordered his own test within the hour. As I ended the call and boxed the packaging up, something fell out. A sturdy envelope of thin navy blue cardboard and sealed with a sunflower emblem. It had a mild chemical smell to it, like a sweet ammonia. At first, I thought it was going to be some kind of special offer, much like what got me that test in the first place. But after turning it over, I could see it was addressed directly to me in handwritten cursive. It read, Congratulations on your recent result. As part of our effort to explore the diverse world of unified heritage and in cooperation with our various multinational partners, we would like to extend an invitation to descendants of Northern Scandinavian Blue Hill Tribe for an eventful day of education, connectivity and celebration. Please consider this invitation and review the enclosed details at personal link using your login credentials. We hope to see you there. I didn't know exactly what to make of it, but I decided to check it out. And holy hell, it reeked of scam. Here's what it offered. A fully paid three day stay at a hotel in Manchester, New Hampshire. Free entry to the company sponsored heritage celebration event alongside other members of both the Blue Hill tribe but also other unique and diverse backgrounds. There were several groups listed, mostly hailing from the Scandis, the Carpathians and the Ural Mountains. I would have to pay for the trip to get there though and they were clear about food, drink and room service not being included. But all in all, it sounded too good to be true. After several hours of trying to find my way through the customer service websites, I finally got a hold of an actual service rep over the phone. At first, they seemed to have no idea what I was talking about, but when I referenced the personal case number at the bottom of the envelope, they referred me to a special events manager. This manager, in turn, confirmed everything. I know, I know, they laughed. I know how it sounds, but this is actually a sort of golden ticket thing. It's a biennial event and part of a charity effort, so there's a tax incentive for us as well. If you can make it, I'd recommend checking it out. They got some event photos on our website for reference. I did, as she suggested, and I gotta say, I was convinced. I accepted. My flight arrived on the morning of the first event day, about three hours ahead of opening. I had an uneventful early check-in 
spotting the locked doors through the lobby. There were a few posters marking the Heritage Celebration event, and there were already a couple of people roaming the halls outside, but I decided to catch my breath a bit before the doors opened. I got to my room and clocked out for a couple of hours. I double-checked the event schedule on my phone, making mental notes of the various talks, guided tours, luncheons, dinners, and get-togethers. It was a full two-day event. I was surprised at just how much there was to do, considering the event was intended for no more than a couple hundred people at most. Still, I couldn't complain. But just as I drifted off for a nap, I got a notification on my phone. A text from my dad. Apparently, he'd recently gotten his results back. Strangely enough, he didn't have any percentage of the Northern Scandinavian Blue Hill tribe in his genetic makeup. Maybe my mom wasn't as southern as she thought. Once the doors opened, there were about a hundred people walking about. Some looked like average Joe nobodies, others were clearly some kind of corporate representative. I could tell at least six different accents just by walking around, and a couple of foreign languages. There were a few booths to check out, mostly advertising various new services and products by the company behind the DNA test, but also one that was just information about various forgotten or unusual tribes. Going through the pamphlets, I couldn't find one about the Blue Hill tribe, so I decided to ask the service rep behind the counter. Blue Hill? He said, raising an eyebrow. I'm not sure I... Another rep whispered something in his ear, and he nodded. Right, he corrected. We don't have any reading material on that subject, but, uh, I think there's an info session. Should be part of the Tribes of the North meetup. I double-checked the schedule again, and made my way to a couple of events. The Tribes of the North meetup was an after-dinner event. Part of the late-night, off-hour socializing thing, they tried to get going. I spent the afternoon listening in on various other topics, trying to pass the time. There was a speaker on the topic of nomadic North American tribes, as well as a workshop about forgotten languages. It was all interesting in its own way, but I found myself drifting away just after lunchtime. I had to take a rest around 3pm because of an upset stomach, a relic from my sickly past. Later, I took a walk around town and had a decent meal at a local restaurant before I headed back to the hotel. I was a few minutes late to the meetup. There were about two dozen people there in total. We didn't really have any common features. We had different skin, hair, eyes, and we were all from different parts of the US. A couple of them were Canadian, and there was this one guy from the Philippines. It was pretty clear who the event organizer was though. A chipper young woman in a black pantsuit with a company logo pin and a digital clipboard. She went around the room confirming that everyone was a member of the Blue Hill. I overheard an older woman mentioning she was categorized as over 30% while a young man mentioned he only had 5%. The young woman cleared her throat and excused herself calmly demanding the attention of the room. Thank you all so much for coming, she smiled. I'm sure you have a hundred questions, and we thought this might be a good time to get to know one another a little better. Please, follow me. We were led through a corridor to a smaller, open room, a sort of meeting space in the back. They turned down the lights a bit, and set out a couple of platters of cheeses, crackers, and some alcohol-free sparkling wine. There were a couple of people there already. I was about to spark up a conversation with a 50-year-old man who looked as confused as me when the chipper young woman took hold of the room again. She directed our attention to a man that I can't for the life of me remember the name of. Weston or Wesley, I think. He, in turn, welcomed us 
and encouraged us to indulge in the various snacks scattered throughout the room. Then he introduced us to the topic of the evening, the Blue Hill Tribe. If there is one thing I am certain of, he started, is that every single person in this room has had a serious medical condition at some point in their life, something unusual. Does anyone mind sharing an example? I didn't speak up about the severe ulcers I had as a kid and the partial transplant I had to get, but there were others who openly shared various issues, heart valve issues, cornea transplants, nerve damage. Everyone seemed to have something. The man just nodded, as if expecting this. This is, sadly, a common attribute of people with lineage dating back to the Blue Hill tribes, so let's take a closer look at the history and customs of these unique people. And while we do, please feel free to mark yourself in the attendance sheet. He continued to speak of a group of people native to the northern Scandinavian mountain ranges. There were dates, locations, an approximate number of tribal members, and a few other sparse details. I marked the form while I waited, realizing pretty early on that what he was saying was suspiciously generic. He spoke of leather and bone craftsmanship and a belief in mountain spirits, but there were no details, no references, no pictures, drawings or artifacts. I noticed a lot of people around the room paying close attention and not really thinking too much about what they were filling out on the attendance sheet, but I took a closer look. Our names were already on the sheet, so we were only supposed to make a check mark. However, there were also percentages printed on the side, corresponding to the percentage of heritage we had in common with this tribe. I recognized my 11% and the 30% of the old woman. There was also a series of other numbers that I didn't immediately recognize. When I thought no one was looking, I snapped a picture of it just in case. After a 15-minute lecture on the history of the Blue Hill Tribe, I came to the realization that I hadn't actually learned anything. The locations and dates were so generic that there was no way to fact-check it, and there were no details as to the various customs and crafts. Looking around the room, I noticed the chipper young woman was off in the corner, whispering to someone on a Bluetooth headset, her eyes scanning the crowd with a serious demeanor. There was a man in a suit by the doorway, taking pictures with his phone, and a hotel functionary offering refreshments being turned away. This was clearly a private matter, and of great interest to the company for some reason. I snapped to attention as the room applauded. The lecture came to an end, and we were given some time to mingle, but not without another reminder to make a mark of the attendance sheet. I chatted a bit with a few people, but it all felt a bit forced. Just a few words here and there. I got the impression that none of us had very much in common. No one seemed to have any idea where that part of their heritage actually came from. There was this one guy who had studied his genealogy extensively, who insisted that it was strictly impossible for him to even be partly Scandinavian. I've mapped out every family member for six generations, he scoffed. There's no way. As more and more people filtered out into the night, I decided to lag a bit to see what was being said behind closed doors. I wasn't sneaking around on all fours like a spy, just lingered a little too long on the other side of the bathroom door or stopping conveniently to check my email near a hushed discussion. I picked up a few bits and pieces, discussions about our percentages for example. There was also talk about a second event the following night and how it wasn't officially on the schedule. They referred to it as a sort of closing ceremony. There was also a short talk about inviting a few of us to a private meeting. I heard two people squabbling a bit about the details and I didn't catch much of it but I clearly heard a sentence as they finished. Just get the ripe ones, one of them snarled. None of that 3% trash. 
I didn't like that. Not one bit. Returning to my room, I decided to pack up my things. I had a bad feeling about whatever they were up to, and I couldn't help but to imagine that they had something planned. Maybe it was all a scam, after all. Or something worse. Either way, I wasn't eager to find out. I couldn't find a reasonably priced flight back home until early morning. It was almost 12 hours away, but I figured I could pull an all-nighter and get out as soon as the sun rose. I could wait a few hours at the airport if need be. With my bags packed and ready, I settled in for a long night. It was somewhere around 2am when I found myself staring at late night TV and scrolling on my phone. As a salesman prattled on in the background, a stray thought hit me. I decided to take another look at the attendance sheet photo. There was a set of numbers by each person that didn't make immediate sense to me. I brought out a pen and paper and started breaking them down. First in sets of twos, then individually, then sets of three, trying to find some pattern or idea. It took me a little longer than I cared to admit to recognize something. The last four numbers correlated to one pattern, floor, and room number. That left four other numbers, which when broken down into pairs of two, correlated to a month and a day. The date itself didn't make much sense though. For me, it was a few days after I'd sent in my first sample. Then it hit me. It was probably the day they received the sample. Taking a closer look at the percentages, I could see that everyone with a 9% heritage or lower was situated on lower floors, while those with 10% and higher all seemed to have the higher floors. Maybe there was a sort of unspoken threshold happening at 10% and up. Could that be what they referred to when they said to get the ripe ones? As I scrolled through various images from previously hosted charity events, I got a notification. My phone warned me that my camera app had unexpectedly closed. Strange, seeing how it wasn't open to begin with. A bad feeling settled in my stomach. I was on the hotel Wi-Fi. Could they be monitoring our activities? I considered the option that I was just being tired and paranoid. That might very well be the case. But on the other hand, I'd heard what I'd heard. It was stressing me out, further upsetting my already sensitive stomach. I could feel a tinge of pain and decided to go get some ice. Might sound like a stupid home remedy thing, but sucking on an ice cube has always helped me calm down. I followed the corridor, got myself some ice in a bucket, and returned to my room. As I was about to round the corner, I recognized a familiar sound. My hotel room door being closed and locked from the outside. Peeking around the corner, I noticed two people dressed in black disappearing down the hall, mumbling quietly to one another. Returning to my room, I couldn't help but to second guess myself. Had the bathroom door always been open? Was the same channel on the TV playing? Had someone moved my bags? It was hard to tell. That's how I spent the night. Wondering. My heart sometimes skipped a beat as I thought I noticed something new, but ultimately, I couldn't find anything immediately threatening. I pulled out my phone battery just in case and kept it in my other pocket. No one would be tracking me anytime soon. I messed my bed to make it look like I had slept in it, even though I spent most of my time in the bathroom ready to lock the door and call the police. I nodded off a few times, but eventually the sun broke the horizon, a few rays of sunshine slipping in through the frosted bathroom window. 
I got my bags and left. One nervous elevator ride later, I slapped down the hotel key on the reception and headed for the exit without elaborating. I accidentally made eye contact with the hotel security guard by the exit, who gave me a curious side eye. Sir? He asked. I stopped briefly and excused myself. He held up a hand. Sir, may I speak to you? He repeated. I have an appointment. I smiled. Sorry. It won't take long. He smiled. Right this way. Looking at the silver-colored revolving door that could get me out of there, I considered my options. I could make a break for it, or I could just see what this was all about. I decided to just talk to the man, banking hard on it not being anything serious. In hindsight, I should have gone for the door. I was taken to a small room right next to the reception. There, he asked to see my phone. I showed him, although the battery was still out. My supervisor has a couple of questions, he said. She's just outside. Won't be a minute. I'm sorry, but I got it. He pocketed my phone, smiled, and stepped out of the room. But it wasn't an ordinary service personnel kind of smile. It was almost apologetic, like he knew he'd landed me in some kind of trouble. And through the door came the chipper young woman from the previous night. She wasn't as chipper this time. She didn't sit down, instead opting to stand on the opposite side of the room with her arms crossed. For a solid minute, she just stood there, considering what to say. Finally, she let out a sigh and took a step forward. I felt like a scorned schoolboy being dragged into the principal's office. Are you leaving early? She asked. Would be a shame to miss the get-together tonight. I'm thankful to have been part of this, I said, but I really ought to get going. Oh? She feigned surprise. Family emergency? That's private. I said. I could still hear the hotel personnel outside and figured she didn't want to make a scene. I leaned back in my chair, confident and quiet. She didn't take that too well. I think it'd be best for you if you stayed a little longer, she continued. I don't think I will. I don't think there's much to debate. I'm sorry, but you have no... She slammed her fist on the table and stared me down, unblinking and furious. There was a slight tremble in her movement. There was no way those outside didn't hear us. And yet, no one moved a muscle. Perhaps she was in more control than I'd anticipated. I think you're going to stick around for a while, she snarled. Or we're going to have a problem. You won't have a problem with me. No... I said, shaking my head. I, uh, I don't... Then you're going to shut the hell up and play along. I was dumbstruck. There was no ambiguity here. She was outright threatening me. I could barely understand why. Maybe she'd seen something on my phone while I was connected to the hotel Wi-Fi, or maybe they noticed me spying. Perhaps they saw me pondering the attendance sheet. I don't know. Either way, they weren't taking any chances. I didn't see that hotel security guard again. Instead, they put me in a room with a very quiet man in a suit. He didn't answer any questions. He wasn't much for small talk. All he did was stand outside the room, checking in on me as soon as I made a noise. I spent all day in that room. This small 10 by 14 room with little more than a couch, a coffee table, and the most generic looking hotel painting I'd ever seen. Still, as calming as that room was, I was freaking the hell out. But there was nothing for me to do at that point. 
No harebrained schemes could make me magically phase through the wall. I was stuck there, and I sure as hell wouldn't fight that guy. Didn't take a detective to spot. He was armed. The stress made my stomach act up. I was allowed to use the bathroom, but they kept the stall door open. Then, it was straight back to the room. I tried frantically to come up with some kind of plan, or figuring out some specific turn of the corridor where he wouldn't have a clear shot. But, it was useless. There were long, wide open spaces and no harsh corners. But that was my mindset. I was still under the impression that there was something I could do. But in reality, I couldn't. Once that started to dawn on me, I realized how screwed I was. It was the emotional equivalent of sinking into a deep black ocean. It was late afternoon when the door opened. Having spent most of the day napping on the couch and anxiously wandering back and forth, I got on my feet like a soldier. One of the guards coaxed me outside. I could tell something was up. People were rushing past us, speaking into their earpieces. We moved in the opposite direction, but I caught a glimpse of a well-dressed group of people used as human shields for someone very important. I was quickly ushered along. I was taken through the hotel kitchen. They'd cleared out the staff. They took me to what looked like an abandoned old walk-in freezer. I was pushed inside and the door was closed. I don't know how those walk-in freezers are supposed to work, but this one locked from the outside. There were no lights and I could barely make out what was happening through the little windows. I didn't have to wait for long. Just minutes after I could hear other people entering the room, some curious, some angry, some crying. One by one, the guests from the previous night were ushered into the freezer, even the old woman. Well, not all the guests. Only those ripe enough. There were nine of us in total. Some were mildly annoyed, others were confused. Finally, they dropped a guy who had been beaten straight onto the floor. He was clearly not okay, trying his best to breathe through his mouth. That set most of us off. Some banged on the door, others screamed at the top of their lungs. No one had a phone or a weapon. The panic rose and it spread like wildfire. Soon, I was right there with them, screaming for someone to let us out. I screamed my voice hoarse, but no one came. We must have been in there for at least 40 to 45 minutes. Our protests died and in the following silence, we heard someone enter the room. A single set of footsteps. They approached, and we all quieted down. I could see the vague outline of a man outside, but our breaths had fogged up the windows and the door. He had a black suit with a blue tie. He stood there with his hands in his pockets, watching us. I backed away from the door. The others did the same. No matter how bad the freezer was, there was something telling me that this guy was somehow worse. He was too calm, like this was all normal. He'd done it before. As the door opened, we all scrambled to get back. He stepped into the entrance, obscured by the bad lighting. But for all I could see, he was a man, a little shorter than me. A bit round around the stomach, bald, maybe glasses. There was something reflecting off his face, and yet, there was something about him that screamed danger. The man who'd been beaten was ready to roll the dice. He took off running, trying to push past and get out. There was a kitchen exit not too far away, so if he could just make it past this guy then, maybe, he'd be in the clear. But no, he didn't get that far. The strange man didn't tackle him, or attack or scream. In fact, he didn't seem to react at all. But the runner, well, he stopped a few steps short of leaving the freezer. He clutched his throat, 
gasping for air. The man spoke in a raspy, matter-of-factly voice, as if counting the inventory on the supermarket shelf. Male, 38 years old, six years spread, reaching a total of 18%, implant through esophagus surgery. And then, there was this ungodly noise. The runner collapsed to his knees. He was trying to scream, but all that came out was a sort of guttural wheeze. It escaped him in waves, involuntarily, until we could see something poking out of his mouth, like the silhouette of a wet branch being pulled out. Finally, there was a snap as it fully dislodged and the freezer began to reek of blood. He stopped moving. The panic consumed us. I may read calm here in the aftermath, but in that moment, I was an animal. I was scratching on the damn walls trying to get back. I didn't care if I was pushing people into the floor or stepping on someone's head. I was desperate. The strange man spoke again, but this time his raspy voice seemed better, improved. Female, 29 years old, 4 year spread reaching a total of 14%, implant through spinal surgery. One by one, he counted us off. Male, female, male, female, 4 years, 5 years, 9, 8, percentages going up and down. Lung cancer, cornea transplant, dialysis, screams and blood. One by one, being pulled out of the crowd, and then pulled apart. I'll never forget the sounds. Small bones sound like carrots when they snap. Bigger ones. It differs. The dripping noise as human spillage mixed on the floor. Drops of blood really do sound heavier than water. And with every victim, I could see something shift in our captor. Straightening back, deeper breaths, like he was absorbing it all into himself taking something back, harvesting. The sixth person on the chopping block was me. He read it all out loud. Male, he began, 31 years old, 24 years spread, reaching a total of 11%, implant through ulcer treatment. My stomach rumbled, moved, twitched, as if coming alive. It wanted to escape me, to break free. It strained against me. I collapsed to the floor, my hands slipping on the blood, seeping into my skin, itching under my fingernails. Then, I felt something move in my pocket. I almost dropped it. I still had my phone battery. I took it out and held it up to my mouth. I could bite down on it drenching myself in acid, or God knows what. My stomach ceased moving, if only for a short reprieve. I looked up at my captor. See, see this, I said. It'll, it'll screw us both up, but you need it, right? You need me whole. There was no response. I could just see him tilting his head down at me. Yeah, if I destroy myself, you get nothing, right? That's it, isn't it? Huh? I placed it between my teeth, ready to bite down like a rabid dog on a juicy bone. He didn't move as I got up. We circled one another. He wasn't about to let me go. He wasn't looking at me in the eyes. He was staring intently at my stomach. He wanted to pull it out of me, to turn it into something else. Or maybe... It was part of him all along, something coming home. No, he said. It ends. He reached out a hand for me, and I bit down without hesitation. To my surprise, there was just a little puff, but that was it. The battery tumbled to the floor, useless. The man instinctively recoiled, but upon seeing that there was no danger... It all came back with a vengeance. 
The pain was immediate and incredible. Something in me moved and I immediately spat up a glob of stomach acid. Then, the battery exploded. It wasn't a big explosion, just a loud bang, like the starting of a pistol race. I slipped and slid my way out of the freezer and had to make a split second decision. I could close and lock the door behind me, effectively sealing him and everyone in there, or I could leave the door open for others to escape. But it wasn't really a choice. Not really. It never is when you get pushed into something like this. I slammed that door shut and let it auto-lock without even thinking about it. Perhaps he asked the guards to clear out. I don't know. But there was no one else in that kitchen. I grabbed a knife from one of the counters, burst through the exit door and disappeared into the night, my stomach stirring like a restless animal, but settling as I got further away. I can only regret what happened to those left behind. It still makes my spine itch. A police patrol found me wandering the streets about an hour or two later. I can't imagine it looked good. I was taking such small, shallow breaths and I was still clutching the knife. Not to mention, I was covered in blood. They were convinced that I killed someone, but I surrendered willingly and eagerly. I tried to tell a coherent story, but they just didn't understand me. Probably didn't make much sense. A shower and a fresh set of clothes later, I explained my experience at the hotel to the best of my ability. Sadly, it didn't really do much. There were no records of the man I described ever visiting that hotel. As for the missing people, those I claimed had been murdered... They had checked out one by one at different hours of the day prior, according to the hotel records. They might be missing, but there was no indication of foul play. Yeah, I'm calling lies on that. So yeah, that was by far the worst time of my life. Looking back at it, it feels unreal, like it happened to someone else. But even now... I can still get little flashes of something that reminds me of that night, and it just pulls me right back. It never really leaves. Whoever that man was, he was important enough to get a whole company to cover for him. I'm sure not all of them knew why they were doing it, but they were complicit. I think we're looking at someone with a lot of resources and a lot of reach. I never got a name and seeing how he seemed to change with every victim he consumed, I can't really tell what he looks like anymore, not even his age or height or weight. There are, surprisingly, some real records about a small tribe of people living from the Blue Hill in the Scandinavian mountain range. There isn't much out there about them, just to mention that they worshipped immortal mountain spirits, others say they worship devils, it's a mixed bag. I don't know what to believe. I don't know what I saw. But I'm living with the knowledge that a part of me, something inside me, isn't my own. It moves with me. It lives with me. But at the snap of a finger from that thing, and it will rebel. It will fail me. And I'm just at, what, 11%? What happens when I reach 50 or 100? I decided to post this after getting a video ad that I could never have anticipated. It seems that this company is still in business, advertising their new generation of DNA tests. I'm sure some of you out there have seen it. 20 seconds, unskippable, smiling faces, distant family members being tied together by a CGI blue ribbon. I think they have some of those damn sunflowers in the background, still coloured, that basic company blue. And seeing it like that, it just... It made my stomach turn.
I remember the first time I saw the man. The thing with a face like melting wax. I knew he had many masks and many names. He had followed our family for years. And from father to son, mother to daughter, the fear and terror of the faceless man got passed down. Every time he came, he would have a different face. The first time I saw him, he looked like a withered old Asian man, leaning heavily on a wooden cane with a silver top. Our front door stood wide open, and I saw my mother and father standing there, their faces as pale as ghosts as they looked down upon the stranger. I couldn't have been older than 11 years old, but the memory is still as sharp as a butcher's knife stuck in my brain. I walked forwards from the living room, the cartoon noises still blaring loudly in the background. The man looked past them, and straight at me. He squinted his eyes, and grinned. Another lamb, so pretty and young, he mused. Isn't it a shame when a child is taken so early in life, and yet God kills children every day? I heard last month a hurricane blew an entire school down and killed a hundred of the little buggers in one swift go. So perhaps God will forgive me for my small sins, my taking of a few here and there to keep my appetite satiated. Get out of here, my father snarled through gritted teeth. He clenched his fists until the knuckles turned white, looking as if he would strike out at any moment. Do you know who I am? The faceless man asked in a whispery voice. Then he began chuckling. It sounded like someone trying to laugh with a slit throat. A harsh, gurgling sound that raised goosebumps all up and down my body. My father slammed the door shut quickly, locking the deadbolts. I fingered the silver cross my mother had given me nervously. I always did when I was anxious. Feeling it laying there against my cold skin helped bring me back to the moment. My father turned to look at us with panic-stricken eyes. I heard light knocking on the door behind him as the demonic laughter continued to grow until it became all I could hear. Then, without warning, it cut off. When I looked out the peephole on the front door, I saw the front stoop stood empty. Get my gun, my father said to my mother. She left the room, quietly sobbing as she went. Sunlight from the warm summer sky continued to stream in through the windows. What a beautiful day, I thought to myself. Such a beautiful day. And maybe my last... Then I saw a shadow cross in front of the living room window. I saw someone peeking in with wide, excited eyes, a grin like a skull spread across his leathered old face. As I watched, the face began to drip and contort as it continued to smile. It started slowly around the lips and eyes, and then it began speeding up. Within seconds, I saw the flesh running down his cheeks and chin in rivulets, dripping like flesh-colored wax. Behind the mask he wore, I caught a glimpse of something horrible before new streams of flesh rolled over it from his scalp and forehead. Then the last of the human skin dripped off, and I found myself staring into the face of hell. I could never explain the true horror of the thing lurking behind its costume of human skin. It felt like staring into a pus-filled wound with maggots writhing around the edges, or maybe like falling into a mass grave. Some of his body seemed flipped inside out, with the glistening muscles on the outside, but the bloody, demonic face was far more disturbing. It had eyes like two smoldering cigarette burns. Its mouth was a slashed, disgusting thing. The lips looked eaten away, 
with ragged patches of flesh surrounding them that seemed to make the smile seem much larger, reminding me of how a clown would do his makeup. I saw that grinning mouth filled with countless needle-sharp teeth above black, saw-ridden gums that writhed and shivered in its lipless mouth. Even through the window, the smell like sulfur and reeking, spoiled meat filtered into the house, seemed to fill the air like a physical presence. Its body looked flipped inside out. I could see the quivering muscles on the skinless figure. It looked deathly thin, and veins ran along the outside of its face and body like thick, dark worms, pulsating with each beat of the satanic heart that lay inside that thing's chest, emanating sickness and evil through every pore of its gleaming body. As it stared into my soul with its black, lidless eyes, I saw in that face all the worst nightmares of the universe. I saw mountains of corpses festering under a hot sun, black holes eating worlds as masses screamed. I saw mothers drowning their children in bathtubs and animals eating each other alive. I saw into eternity, and it looked so dark and empty that I fell to my knees, pleading. Make it stop. Make it stop, I cried, tears streaming down my face. My father ran in with his shotgun raised, but when I looked back up, the window was empty. Yet, the visions continued to run through my mind like a movie, atrocity after atrocity, and somehow, it all connected back to the faceless man. After a few seconds of utter silence, that deep, gurgling voice rang out, making us all jump. It seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once, reverberating throughout the room. It said something that made my father waver on his feet. A strange verse, but one I remember by heart to this day. Here is Belladonna, the Lady of the Rocks, the lady of situations. Here is the man with three staves, and here is the one-eyed merchant and this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man. After that, we barricaded the doors and locked all the windows. I knew it wouldn't keep the faceless man out, he could easily just smash through a window, and perhaps he wouldn't even need to do that. Maybe he could pass inside the house any time he wanted. And yet, if so, why hadn't he? So, it started again, my mother said, looking at my father with a powerful intensity in her eyes. He has come back again for a sacrifice. My father nodded slowly. What do you mean, a sacrifice? I asked, my child's mind not comprehending the magnitude of the situation yet. My father hesitated. He eats the souls of people, my father said. He and my great-grandfather drew up a contract a long, long time ago, and ever since, our family has had great wealth. You're young, so you don't really understand fully yet. But not everyone lives in mansions like us. Not everyone vacations in Paris and Buenos Aires during the summer vacation. Not everyone has a garage full of Porsches and Mercedes. So, why don't you just tell him no? I asked in my childish way. We don't need all this money. The left side of my father's face began to twitch. He stumped towards me shouting as tears ran down his face. I don't give a damn about the money, he cried. The deal was drawn in blood and cursed from the first day. Do you think if I could get him to go away by giving him everything I own, I wouldn't? I would do it in a heartbeat. I would live in a goddamn trailer and eat instant noodles if I had to. But there's no escape. He looked around, as if expecting to see the faceless man standing right behind him. 
he began looking out the windows, seeing nothing but a bright summer's day. We need to go, my mother whispered. Now, let's take Susan and go. He won't find us if we keep moving. He'll find us, my father said, looking defeated. Tears continued to stream down his face. He looked like a defeated man. He always does, but screw it. Let's go. We'll take this asshole on and run around the world. We took off from the property, and my father told me more about the deal as we flew out of town in an expensive Mercedes, redlining the accelerator. I thought more than once he would crash and kill us all in his frenzy to put distance between us and the faceless man. Once every fifty years, my father said, he comes. He has his pick of the litter, as he calls it. He takes one child from our family, and in exchange, our wealth is guaranteed for the next fifty years. Even during the Great Depression, our family didn't suffer. Except, of course, the periodic abductions of children. He makes the parents watch as he takes the soul of the child into himself. I don't know what kind of foul magic it involves, but from what I've read in the diaries of my grandfather, it's a very painful ritual that involves skinning the child alive and rubbing their body with special herbs. Then he makes them walk, totally skinned and bleeding to death until they collapse, and that's when he takes the soul. He sucks it out of their eyes. It looks like thin wisps of light when it finally goes. I shook inwardly in horror. No one would ever allow that to happen to their kid, I said confidently. My father shook his head. You act as if we have a choice, he said. The first time, he comes politely, knocks on the door and tells the parents it's time to fulfill the contract. If they say no, then he leaves. But he always comes back. And the next time, he won't be polite, and he won't leave. He'll come into the house when we're sleeping, torture me and your mother to death, slit our throats and then take you away. He's tireless, he doesn't age, he doesn't sleep. And, as far as I know, he can't die. How can we fight against such an evil? By going to the moon? But why would Great Grandpa make a deal like that anyway? I asked. Because, at the time, he had ten children, and all of them were starving. A few had dysentery, and he didn't have a penny to his name at the time. He chose to sacrifice one, and give it to the faceless man to save the other nine. My father shrugged. I don't know if we can understand it. I certainly don't agree with it. I'm not sure he realized at the time that our family would suffer eternally afterwards, and that the contract could not be voided except through death. He laughed bitterly. We should have just let our family line die out, maybe. That would have solved the problem. What about those words at the end, Daddy? I asked. What did those mean? Oh, that's just a famous old poem. My grandfather used to recite it to me before he shot himself. He loved T.S. Eliot, and he thought the poem had some relevance to our problems, for some reason. He never got over the loss of his son to the faceless man, you see. Never. He used to wake up screaming at night. He tried to drink his memories away. But, in the end... My father braked suddenly, bringing the car to a full stop. I looked up seeing forests on both sides of us. We hadn't travelled long. A hitchhiker stood at the edge of the road in grimy blue jeans and a bright tie-dye shirt. His long hair rippled around him as he stood with his thumb out. But his face had started to drip and melt. We all saw it and froze. My father reached down below his seat and pulled out the black shotgun. He ran out of the car like a madman, his eyes blazing with anger and terror. Get out of here, 
he cried as if to a rabid animal, then raised the gun and fired. The faceless man's tie-dye shirt burst into shreds as Buckshot tore into it. The faceless man smiled, raised his hand to us in a wave, and disappeared. The clothes fell limply to the grass below, now totally empty. My father shook his head grimly and turned around to come back to the car. A dark shape zoomed out of the forest, holding a sharp knife. Before my father could turn, he raised it to his throat and pulled. My mother screamed, getting out of the car to go help my father. But he was dead. Even as a child, I knew it. I could see the knife had practically severed his head from his body, except for the spine and a thin bit of flesh on the back. Blood poured out, flooding down his chest as he stood there for a moment, uncomprehending. Then he began to fall forwards, and his head snapped back, revealing the gore, muscle and ligaments beneath. I watched as my mother ran to his side, panic-stricken. The faceless man looked on with glee, laughing and shrieking. His black eyes blazed with an inner light as he looked towards me and grinned, showing the hundred needle-sharp teeth behind that supertuating sore of a mouth. My mother looked up at him, trying to grab the gun from my father's stiff hands, but the faceless man didn't flinch. He ran forwards, his sleek, bloody body as fast as a greyhound's. He opened his mouth wide and bit at my mother's face. I saw the teeth bite into his skin, and he began to shake his head like a dog, ripping and shredding. Her face became a mask of gore, and I screamed in the car, nearly thrown up. But something inside told me I needed to move. I wasn't a stupid kid after all. I was going to die here next to some woods in the middle of nowhere. I ran out of the back seat and jumped into the driver's seat. I'd never driven a car, but it was, after all, an automatic. It didn't take much intelligence to put it in drive and hit the gas pedal. Of course, I didn't really know how to drive and I nearly hit a tree. I skidded, turning the wheel, and with two bumps, I accidentally ran over my mother and father. The faceless man shrieked with laughter as I drove off down the road, crying and screaming in the car. I abandoned it a few hours later in the city. My father had brought a massive envelope of cash with him in the center console, and I counted it with awe. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars. I went on the run soon after, moving across the country and living on the money I found. It was four years later, when I went to a carnival board and decided to have my future read. I hadn't seen the faceless man in years, and I figured I'd lost him. If only that were true. The old woman pulled out a tarot deck and began flipping them over one by one. Ah, she said in a voice that seemed to deepen. I see. Here is the man with three staves, and here is the wheel, and here is the one-eyed merchant. I screamed, backing up quickly as the flesh began to drip from her face. And this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. The last of the skin dripped off. The grinning thing beneath froze from the chair, its sleek, bloody body and black holes of eyes regarding me with glee. Ah, yes, I am forbidden to see, but I've seen it. And look what it's done to me, Susan. Look what it's done. Your mother and father rot in a shallow grave somewhere, picked clean by animals. And now it's just you and me, Susan. And we're alone. The card is blank, but it doesn't have to be. Come and see what it holds. 
He rose into the air, his bloody skeletal feet dangling above the ground. Come and see. I pulled the pistol I always carried out of its holster and began firing point blank into the demonic face and black heart of that thing. People began to scream all around me at the carnival. I turned to run out of the tent, but a cold hand gripped my shoulder. Leaving so soon? The soft voice whispered in my ear, laughing with a sound a drowning man might make. Ah, but we haven't finished, Susan. Worthy is the lamb, worthy is the... Suddenly, the hand touched the silver cross my mother had given me as a small child, and it flinched away. I felt the grip loosen, and I ran without looking back. People had taken cover all over the carnival. Many had started to leave, and I saw agitated police and security trying to find out where the gunshots had come from. I immediately mixed into a large crowd and made my way towards the exit. But I constantly looked back, expecting to see a man with a melting face. Perhaps he would act like a police officer and pretend to arrest me before bringing me to some dark forest and starting the skinning process. I keep running now, but I always look over my shoulder. Because the faceless man doesn't age, and he doesn't sleep, and he never ever stops looking. I barely made it home in time. One minute I was singing along to the radio, and the next I was staring, slack-jawed, at the most menacing storm clouds I'd ever seen. As someone born and raised in Vermont, I was no stranger to snow squalls, but there was something foreboding about the dark clouds blowing in over the mountains. After reaching my house, I opened my car door and stepped out into a cold evening. The wind lashed at my face and made a terrible howling in my ears as I raced up the steps and slipped through the front door to my house. Just in time, Luke said to me in greeting. My husband was staring in front of the living room window, surveying the mountains beyond our city. By the time I walked over to him, I could barely see two streets down. It seemed like we would be spending the evening inside. Came out of nowhere, I commented. Before I so much as set my bag down, I heard the doggy door open. We didn't own any pets but we often entertained visits from a neighborhood cat who Luke had called Rigatoni. Sure enough, an old orange cat soon appeared in our living room, leaving a trail of muddy paw prints as he trotted over to Luke. Ah, the serial couch surfer returns. Too cold out there for you? He asked the cat, currently rubbing her head against his shin, who meowed as if in affirmation. Tony wasn't terribly fond of most people, but Luke had a way with animals. He reached down to pet her, eliciting a melody of purrs from the contented cat. Come on, he said, standing. I'll fix you some dinner. Thank God, I'm starving. I wasn't talking to you, Luke said with a warm laugh, walking into the back of the house to fetch some cat food for Tony. Half an hour later, just as Luke and I had finally sat down to eat, we heard the doggy door open once again. I raised the brow at my husband. Tony was our only regular four-legged visitor. I wondered who else could have let themselves inside our home. I didn't have to wonder for long. Seconds later, a border collie tore into the dining room barking and whining with urgency. Luke and I rose sharply to our seats at the table, watching the dog as it came to a stop in the corner of the room. I realized as the poor creature lowered its head and tucked its tail between its legs that I recognized it. Hey, that's Mrs. Johnson's dog, I said, 
rounding the table to check if the dog was hurt. Tucker? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I see her walking him all the time. I crouched down next to Tucker and slowly reached out my arm. To my surprise, the usually sweet-tempered border collie pulls its lips back in a snarl, lunging forward slightly and snapping his teeth. It was a warning, not an attempt to hurt me, but I backed off all the same. Luke shot me a worried look. He's, uh, usually more mild-mannered. I'll give her a call and let her know he's with us. Luke left the room to grab his phone while I studied Tucker from a safe distance, looking for signs of injury. His frantic barks had been replaced by occasional mournful whines. He was no longer racing around, seemingly content with his place in the corner, but his posture remained fearful and defensive. It was hard to tell with the way he was carrying, but I saw no visible wounds on him. Do you have signal? Luke shouted from another room. I took my phone out of my pocket to check, and to my surprise, I didn't. We had generally reliable coverage, and I couldn't remember the last time I'd lost cell service. I tried restarting my phone, walking around at different spots in the house, and turning airplane mode on and off. Nada. Unfortunately, if it was affecting both of us, it was probably an issue with our service provider, meaning there was little we could do. I was about to ask if he still had Wi-Fi on his phone, when a light but urgent tapping sound filled the room. I listened for a moment, trying to place the origin of the sound, and soon traced it to the bathroom, or more specifically, the bathroom window. When I got there, I saw a small, fuzzy animal standing on the windowsill and scratching fervently at the glass. What in the world? The little creature didn't seem to notice my presence. I took another step forward into the bathroom, and I realized as I approached that the animal had torn right through the window screen. No cell service, no Wi-Fi, no nothing. At least the lights are on... Luke trailed off as he entered the room, looking over my shoulder at the frantic creature. Is that... a weasel? I asked my resident animal lover, who shook his head. Pretty sure that's a marten. Neat. I was about to compliment his identification skills before I looked over and saw the look in his eyes. Don't ask me what I think you're about to ask me. Please... They're endangered, you know. This isn't Noah's Ark, Luke. We can't shelter every animal in Vermont. I swear, the rodent took a break from ripping through my window screen to glare at me. I glared right back. Besides, this little thing here looks rabid. Luke and I spent a couple minutes arguing. I wasn't keen on taking in any more impromptu guests, but Luke was adamant on saving it from the storm. There's something off about how desperately he's trying to get in, he said. It might be on the verge of freezing to death or something. After a while, he convinced me to take pity on the marten. I had to admit, the way it was throwing itself against the glass was a little unsettling. Reluctantly, I opened the window and allowed it to squeeze through the hole in the screen. However, I didn't realize that the marten wasn't the only creature waiting to get inside. Before I could shut the window, a flurry of about 20 mice surged into the bathroom from the hall. They must have been sitting on the sill as well, but I guess I overlooked them, mistaking their fluffy white bodies for snow. I jumped backwards, swallowing a shriek as one of them landed right on my foot. Eventually, I managed to shut the window without stepping on any mice, but not before a red bird, a cardinal, I think, squeezed this way in as well. Stunned, I hurried after the animals as they made a beeline for the center of the house. When I entered the dining room, I saw not only Tucker and the animals who had just burst in through the bathroom, 
but also a cat and two dogs that I didn't recognize. Cursing, I realized that they must have entered through the doggy door, so I yelled out to Luke to lock it as I tried to make sense of the scene in front of me. The animals gave each other a wide berth. The cat didn't so much as look at the mice, nor did the dog seem at all interested in the cat. All of them were cowering, shivering as they pressed themselves into corners or squeezed into whatever hiding spot they could find. The dogs whined, the mice squeaked, even the cardinal was making a strange, almost mournful sounding chirping noise. The only one who was behaving normally was Rigatoni, who I had to shoo away from the troop of mice hiding under the china cabinet. The hell is going on? Luke asked, and I had no explanation to offer. We'd had nasty storms before, but never had I seen one inspire such desperation in our local wildlife. After another failed attempt at coaxing Tucker out of his corner, I made my way to the living room and stared out the large window. A total whiteout stared back at me. I could only see a few feet out in every direction before the world was swallowed up by darkness and snow. It was eerie, but it was beautiful in a strange way. Hypnotic. It was easy to lose myself in thought as I watched the snow fall. What could have spooked the animal so much, I wondered. Could it really be the cold alone? The weather hadn't seemed all that bad. Sure, it had been cold outside, but not a blizzard cold. When I'd opened the bathroom window, I'd been distracted by the mice, but when I thought about it, I didn't remember a freezing cold wind sweeping into the house alongside our animal guests. I raised my arm, pressing the back of my hand against the glass, and then stilled. Lou? I quietly called out. He appeared around the corner seconds later, Tony cradled in his arms. Is it just me, or is the glass warm? Luke stepped closer, shifting to hold the cat in one arm and placing his free hand against the pane. He didn't respond, but the way his mouth set into a thin line told me that he felt the same thing. What does this mean? I don't know. We both stood in silence for a while. The wind howled outside, but I had the sense that if I opened a window and stuck my hand out, it wouldn't feel cold. I didn't want to find out though. Opening any windows or doors at that point seemed like a bad idea. In fact, I was about to check that all entry points to our house were secured, when Luke pointed at something outside. A large, black mass ambled its way towards us. At first, I didn't understand what I was looking at. Its shape and gait was so strange that I thought I was looking at a brand new animal. But once it stepped fully into the faint glow emanating from the porch light, I realized that it was a black bear. Its lower jaw and one of its hind legs had been ripped off and from the trail of blood it had left in its wake, it was clear that the wounds were fresh. The bear stumbled closer, stopping only inches from the glass, and with every wary step, I could make out another laceration on its body. I watched in horror as the massive creature stared directly at us with a look in its eyes that it could only be described as pleading. I held its gaze for a few seconds, and then the creature collapsed onto its side. A puddle of dark red pulled outward from its body, and soon the strange expansions and contractions of its ribcage ceased. Never once did it look away from us as it bled out and died. There was a long silence before Luke and I dared to speak. You think... Luke began... You think that's what the animals were afraid of? I hoped so, 
but something in my gut told me that I wasn't. After all, even if that was the creature they'd been running from, the question still remained. What could have inflicted that level of trauma on a black bear of that size? I think we should get away from the windows. As we made our way to the middle of the house, the lights flickered once, twice, and then abruptly went out altogether. We were plunged suddenly into darkness, and it seemed to put the animals even more on edge than before. The squeaks and whines increased in volume as I procured two flashlights from our kitchen cabinet. I handed one to my husband, and then the two of us took to the dining room, sitting on the floor with our backs against one of the walls. Luke was calm on the surface, but I could tell that the strangeness of the situation was causing him distress. At least Tony's presence seemed to bring him some peace of mind. For some reason, she was unaffected by whatever ailed the others. I studied her as she relaxed in Luke's lap, her eyes closing as he absentmindedly stroked her fur. Why was it that she was unafraid? She had come to our house right before the blizzard set in, whereas the rest of the animals likely had been outside for longer. Had they seen something out in the storm? If they had, could it have been the same thing that killed the bear? Hey, Luke's shaky voice broke through my thoughts. Do you hear that? I didn't hear anything, and then I realized I didn't hear anything. No wailing of the wind, no sounds from the animals, nothing. It was like the whole world had suddenly gone quiet. I looked around the room. All of the animals were so still, it was as if they were afraid to move. I clicked my flashlight off, wanting to attract as little attention as possible, and Luke followed suit. For a moment, we just sat there in the dark, listening. And then, I heard a voice. Hello? Clear as day, the voice of a person was calling to us from outside our house. Hello? Anyone in there? It asked its tone far too nonchalant for someone weathering the full brunt of a blizzard. I need some help out here. Next to me, Luke shifted as though he were about to stand up. I reached out and grabbed a hold of his arm, grabbing Tony and pulling Luke back down to the floor. There wasn't a chance in hell I was about to let him investigate the voice. It was so strangely quiet that I could hear the crunching of footsteps in the snow as the person moved outside. Please, the voice said. It had gotten closer, like it was circling the house. Please, I really need help. Can I just come in for a minute? It's so cold out here. My grip tightened on Luke's arm. The complete lack of emotion in the voice's tone sending a chill up my spine. He reached over, holding my hand in his, as the source of the voice moved even closer. Come on now, don't you have room for one more? It was right outside the dining room window. I closed my eyes like a coward, not wanting to see whatever it was about to step into view. Next to me, there was a single, sharp intake of breath. For what felt like an eternity, neither of us moved. And then, there was a light chuckle from outside the window. There were more footsteps, but this time, they were moving away from us, and they seemed to be taking the silence with them. The wind remembered itself, returning with a howling vengeance in the visitor's absence, Luke's hand had gone slack in mine, but I held onto it for a long time, sitting there with my eyes shut tight. It must have been an hour before I dared to open my eyes and breathe normally again. 
Are you okay? I finally asked. No response. I tried asking again, a little louder, and still my husband didn't respond. Luke? When I clicked on the flashlight, I saw Luke staring at the window, his face twisted into an expression of horror I'd never seen before. His skin was pale, and his body was rigid as a corpse, and try as I did, I couldn't get him to respond to me in any way. His look of sheer terror never once changed, even as I carried him to the car and drove us as fast as I could to the hospital. The doctor said it was a stroke. Of course, I was incredulous that such a thing could happen to my fit, non-smoking 29-year-old husband, but no one could offer me a better explanation. For the next few days, I waited for a recovery that never came. Then, the days turned into weeks, the weeks into months, and the months into years. While Luke regained some very minimal motor control, blinking and twitching his fingers, it was clear that he would never be the same. I became his full-time caretaker, spending my days attending to all of his needs and my nights praying that he would make a miraculous recovery. As of this evening, five years have passed since the storm. Old Rigatoni is still alive and kicking somehow, and her visits always seem to make Luke perk up just a little bit. She's sleeping on his chest as I tell this, taking care of him in her own way. I'm glad to have her around, but even though I try not to be superstitious, her presence always brings me back to the night of the blizzard. I think about Tucker, who ran away after the storm passed and was never seen again. I think about the marten and the mice and the bear, and the way all of them acted like they were fleeing from something terrible. I think about the look on Luke's face, and I can't help but wonder if they all saw the same thing. Maybe Luke saw something he wasn't meant to, something that his brain had destroyed itself trying to comprehend. I look at my husband, the love of my life, and can't help but mourn what was taken from me that night. If I had opened my eyes, if I had been brave enough to look, would I have met the same fate? What did you see? I ask him, like I have a thousand times before. I never get an answer. My name is Carter, I take pride in my work, and I work on the pipes. My current job revolves around an oil pipeline in the Persian Gulf, it's at the very bottom of the sea between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's just gone midday, but unfortunately, we are too far down for the light at the surface to reach us, so my current surroundings are illuminated by nothing more than the yellowish beam of my flashlight. A small collection of bubbles escape from my diving mask. They ripple up and out of sight as I gently kick my flippers, slowly propelling myself through the gloom. As a worker down here, I am one of three, but the others are not currently visible to me. My beam lands on a great metal pipe, the one that extends up into the habitat a cage like artificial pocket of air and down, down to the depths below. I look down and cast my beam over the pipe's body. The light catches on nothing but the rusted metal, a lone cylindrical obelisk in the watery world around me. I lower the beam. I cast it as far down as it will go, but all I see are my flippers beneath me, gently kicking and the great pipe vanishing into the blue-black darkness beneath my feet. A chill passes through my body. I hear the sound of my heartbeat in my ears. 
where this vertical pipe connects to its horizontal brother on the ocean floor, there is an enormous metal structure of sorts, one with the purpose of keeping a series of temporary installments attached to the pipe in place. I cannot see this monstrosity at present, but the simple act of knowing, knowing that far below lurks a monstrous metal skeleton waiting patiently beneath my feet. A shiver. They tell tales about this place, you know, about the sea. Tales of malevolent spirits that play tricks on divers. Water jin, they're called. These spirits show divers illusions and distortions to confuse them. They get them deliberately lost as a form of... amusement, the tales say. And then, depending on the spirits' moods, they either get bored and let them go, or... They devour them. Something glitters in the gloom in the corner of my eye, and I wheel around in the water, raising the beam of the flashlight, a gasp escaping into my mask. But the beam lands on nothing more than a school of tiny silver fish. They flitter by and pay me no mind, and I catch my breath. Idiot Kadar, I mutter to myself, my voice obscured by the mask and I kick my way up through the water, following the pipe towards the habitat's air pocket. I see the waterline rippling above me. It draws closer and closer, and I catch sight of flashes of color beyond. My comrades. Eventually, I break through the surface, popping off my mouthpiece and raising my mask, shaking my hair as I clamber up onto the little platform that surrounds us. A bench-like apparatus that goes all the way around the inside rim of the habitat. As I said before, I am one of three. My colleagues are called Amir and Ahmad, and they sit waiting for me, their legs dangling over the side, their flippers dipped in the water beneath. I let out a grunt and a sigh as I take a seat beside them, my own flippers half submerged in the water beneath. It seems almost paradoxical, this little space, a marvel of physics. We sit far below the surface of the sea, in the small confines that the habitat provides, and yet, we have air. The habitat is a metal box, about four meters in width and three in height. The air in here is dank and stale, but it is, at the least, quite breathable. From the center of the water between us, the pipe extends up and into the stagnant air. The pipe is currently corked by an enormous rubber plug, one that we will need to deflate before our shift is over. Its purpose is to prevent the oil inside the pipe leaking out into the sea. Thanks to the habitat, we can safely remove it now, without risk of environmental damage. The pipe in question goes all the way down to the bottom of the sea in a straight line, and there it splits in two and travels horizontally across the sea floor. One end travels north, a few miles out of the Saudi Arabian coast, and the other travels south. It's just about wide enough for a man to squeeze down, should an emergency repair need taking place from the inside, but the diameter is not large. I wipe some of the salt water from my face as Amir connects a long, black cable to the depressurizer. The end of the cable leads down into the pipe and is connected to the rubber plug. See any spirits down there today, Kadar? Amir asks me as he fastens the seal on the cable. The Jean al Bahar? Ahmed chuckles, scratching his beard. His voice, as does Amir's echoes around the somewhat claustrophobic confines of the habitat. I smile dryly. No spirits, Amir. Just... I think about the pipe, disappearing down into the darkness far below. I can't quite explain why it gives me the creeps. It just does. Just what? Amir asks. Nothing. I finish. What about you guys? Any spirits? I turn to Ahmad. Have you finally caught sight of Jean al-Bahar? I wave my hands and fingers mysteriously, teasing him. 
but Ahmed is undaunted. You mock Kadar, but this sea, this ancient sea, if we're going to see one, then it'll be here. He claps his hands together, and a small shower of water droplets splash down onto the water by our feet. The shimmering blue gateway to the sea below, the sea above, and the ocean all around. And I'll tell you what else. He continues, raising a finger. I did see something. Oh, here we go. The mere mutters, rolling his eyes. No, no, listen. Ahmed says hurriedly. Just listen to this. So, there I was, right, about an hour ago, swimming around near the pipe, when I may have gotten a little distracted by a fish. Amir shakes his head, and we exchange a glance. You should have seen it, Amir. A great golden thing. I wanted a better look, so I left the pipe and followed it, just for a short while. And eventually, he got spooked and vanished into the blue. Ahmed falters. He rubs his chin. It was actually quite an alarming experience. I turned back to the pipe and, of course, I saw nothing but the endless void of the ocean. I tried to retrace my steps, but again, there were no steps. I was alone. It was... frightening. Amir and myself remained silent. But then, that's when I saw it. I saw them. Ahmed continues, practically jumping on the metal ledge we're all perched on. Hey, easy, I say as I feel myself rattle in time to his jumps. Amir flicks a switch on the depressurization machine. It starts to rumble. Ahmed leans forward, looking between us. Out there, in the far distance, I see a trio of shapes. Three figures, like shadows in the deep and the gloom. You should take a poetry, the mayor mutters as he flicks another switch. Against my sense of better judgement, I am too engrossed by Ahmed's story to pay attention to exactly what it is he is doing. What kind of shapes? I ask. What kind of figures? They were like smoke. Except, no. More like mist, maybe. Thick, dense mist. With eyes that flickered pale like refracting sunlight. You had to look a certain way to see them. Ackman's voice drops low. Becomes wistful. I saw them for only a second or two. And then they were gone. Vanished. How do you get back to the pipe? I ask. Did the spirit show you the way? Amir chuckles. Well, no. I just used the compass. Ahmed says. But that's beside the point. I saw something. I know I did. I thought the spirits were supposed to be dangerous. Amir says. The stories always tell of how cruel they are. They play pranks on divers like us, you know. They bang on the pipes. They groan and moan from the inside. Makes you think that there are monsters inside, waiting to burst right out and get you. Maybe that's why they appear to me, Ahmed says thoughtfully, then gestures to the pipe between us. Maybe they were trying to warn us. Perhaps there's a monster in the pipe. Amir snorts. Don't be ridiculous. Maybe once the plug is deflated, Ahmed says softly, maybe the beast will spring right out. And where would we go? We are effectively trapped down here when you really think about it. There is a moment of uncomfortable silence, broken only by a slow hissing produced by the depressurization machine as it begins its work deflating the plug in the pipe. Nonsense, Amir says after a beat, shaking his head. Don't say such stupid stuff. All I'm saying, Ahmed finishes, shrugging is that the spirits aren't necessarily something to be feared. I know you guys don't really believe, but they can be helpful too. They don't devour people. The Jean al Bihar, mischievous maybe, but not unkind in their own way. Emir grunts and waves his hand dismissively. Ahmed looks at me for support, and I just laugh. Come on, I say. Enough is enough, I think. We have work to do. I wouldn't want Zahir to snitch on us again. 
the conversation shifts and a collective groan echoes around the habitat. I can't stand that guy, Amir says dramatically. We all laugh. A collective dislike of the man has become a running joke between us. Zahir is technically a colleague of ours, and although we rarely work in close capacity, his projects always seem to be in tandem to our own, so we're never quite rid of him. He has thick red hair and a ridiculous scraggly beard, and all in all, he makes himself an easy target. A busybody and a teacher's pet, you see. He clocks in more hours than he has to, unpaid I might add, yet despite his enduring and tragic efforts, he always gets passed up for promotion because he has a vacuum for a personality. Zahir is entirely devoid of charisma. Maybe we should play a prank on him before we go up, Amir suggests as the machine deflating the plug kicks up a gear. The hissing grows louder. What kind of prank? Ahmed asks. I don't know, we could head over to his site in Azraquan, bang some pipes, make some noise, give him a little spook before his shift is over. Could be fun. Wouldn't be worth it, I reply. As much fun as that sounds, Azraquan is a kilometre and a half away. Do you really want to swim all that way for some childish prank? And besides, we never fool Zaheer with that spirit nonsense. The man doesn't believe in anything. He's got no imagination. True, Amir nods regretfully. He fiddles with the machine beside him and gives it a light slap. And it does its job. It finishes deflating the plug to a sufficient degree, freeing up a space around it and opening a way down into the pipe. What this was supposed to do was allow us to reach in, haul the deflated plug out, check for leaks, damage, and whether the plug needs a potential replacement. We should have been able to do this easily and safely, as the pipe, at this time, and on this day, is supposed to be filled with oil. For whatever reason, however, the pipe is not. There is, as it turns out, significantly less oil inside than we were told, and as was believed. And so, what happens instead takes place over the course of a few terrible seconds, a true nightmare that I will never, ever be able to forget. The positive pressure inside the habitat, the little atmosphere keeping us alive, rushes instantaneously into the pipe and forces down the small amount of oil at a monstrous, inhuman speed. This motion creates what I can only describe as a blinding vortex. The air and the ocean are hauled up and around us like a sudden whirlwind of chaos and terror in the blink of an eye. My vision is lost to a brutal and immediate rush of darkness as my body is slammed into the habitat wall. I scream, but all that I could produce is froth and bubbles as my shoulder cracks on the edge of something metal. I do not know which way is up or down. The safety and sanctuary of the habitat is shattered. I can see nothing but shadow as water blasts into my nose and my mouth and eyes, and I am sucked instantly and brutally down into the pipe. I can feel its walls pressing against me on all sides as I am dragged cataclysmically between them. I am forced through the water and the oil head first at near breakneck speed. Blood rushes to my head as my arms and legs are smashed and battered against the metal. There is only terror, terror and darkness. My head strikes against the metal as the pipe levels out, and the world behind my screwed shut eyelids flashes red, then white. A ringing echoes in my ears and competes with the thunderous rush of the water as I release an involuntary bellow of pain. Oil and seawater pour into my mouth, my lungs, and I swallow some and breathe in the rest, choking and drowning as I am dragged through the pipe along the seafloor. I'm going to die. This one singular thought plays over and over in my head. I'm going to die, and this is the end. 
the terror of my situation for a quick fleeting moment is replaced by an eerie calm. The sounds of the rushing, hammering water do not lessen, but I find my altitude changed. It soothes me, and I think about a beach I visited as a young child with my family as I prepare to exhale my final breath. Except, instead of producing bubbles as I do so, I instead begin to choke and to splutter. I start to cough, spluttering, coughing, and I realize at once that this can only mean one thing. I have found air. I gasp and retch. I try to bring my hands up to my mouth, but they bang painfully against the inner wall of the pipe. My right wrist throbs angrily, sending shards of pain shooting up my arm. I think the entire hand may be broken. Air, I think to myself, and the vision of the beach is lost. The terror floods immediately back into my mind in the same manner as the water was hauled into the pipe. Most of my head is submerged in water. Though my eyes, nose and mouth are free, I can lift my head then my ears are raised above the waterline and I am able to hear, but the action presses on my forehead against the cold metal above me. I start moving and the reality of my situation sets in. I'm in the pipe. Oh no, I murmur aloud, retching as I cough up water and oil. Oh no, 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 I scream. I slam my good fist against the metal, shouting for help. Please, I scream into the pitch black darkness. Please, someone, Amir, Ahmed. Panic strikes. There is nowhere to go, nowhere to run, and no one to hear me. I can barely move. The water ebbs and sloshes around my face, and I gasp. My breathing becomes shallow and dangerous. You're not drowning. I have to keep telling myself, you're not drowning, you have some air, you can breathe, you can breathe, calm yourself, calm yourself, Gadar. I try to raise my legs, and one of my flippers kicks against the roof of the pipe. I try to turn a little to my side, and realize that to do so requires significant effort and a reasonable degree of pain. I've done some serious damage to my shoulder, and my neck too perhaps. The simple act of raising my head causes immense pain to shoot down my spine, but to allow my head to lower completely would mean the majority of my face is submerged. I force myself to slow my breathing. That's the priority. Nice, slow breathing. In and out. Slow, deep breaths. With grunts of pain and a hammering heart, I shuffle and twist as best I can, searching my person for my scuba equipment. I believe that I am wearing only a single flipper now. I think the other must have been torn off as I was sucked into the pipe. No other equipment can be found. My breathing mask and the air tank. It's all gone. It's gone. Oh God, I whisper and despite my sense of logic, I bang on the pipe. Hello, I shout into the inky darkness. Hello, is anyone there? Kada, comes a voice a little ways back along the pipe. It echoes from the darkness beyond my feet. I try to raise my face a little higher, to look down into the void, but it's futile. I can see nothing. Hello? I shout back. Who is it? Ahmed, are you alright? Kadar, he shouts, a relief tempered with terror. You're alive. I can breathe. Are you okay? Another voice echoes from beyond even Ahmed. It is fainter, but I can still hear it. Guys? Guys, comes the voice of Amir. Guys, are you both alright? Thank the Lord, I mutter holding back a sob of relief. Amir, Ahmed, it's Kadar. Are you hurt? Yes, Amir calls after me. I believe one of my arms is broken. 
Likewise, Amir shouts. Then, a little quieter. Damn, I think my legs are too. Oh god. He releases what sounds like a cry of pain, then swears. What do we do? Ahmed calls into the pipe. What do we do? He kicks against the pipe, and the sound reverberates down and over my head. Okay, hold on, hold on, I shout, clenching my hands into fists, thinking, using my overheating brain as best as I can. The three of us are alive. We're trapped in the pipe at the bottom of the sea. No one knows we're down here, and once they find the wreckage of the habitat, they'll probably assume we were killed instantly, cast out into the sea perhaps. I feel the panic returning. I try to stretch my limbs, but I'm unable. I kick the pipe in frustration and let out a shout of rage. Kadar, calm down, calls Ahmed. It's alright, we'll be alright. Yes, yes, I need to calm down. First things first, the pipe, when it reaches the sea floor, splits into two. I do not know if we have been pulled north towards the site of Azrak 1, or south towards the site of Azrak 2. How far away are they? I try to think. Azrak 1 is situated around 1.5 kilometers north of our former location of the habitat. Azrak 2 is over twice that distance south. I have no idea how far along we were pulled down the pipe. It all happened so fast. We could be hundreds of meters in either direction by now. All I know is that the air we're breathing, the pocket created, is likely due to the undulations of the pipe. Small bumps and raises over support beams. It's entirely possible that there are more of these further down the tunnel. But how large is each air pocket? And at what point do they run out? Okay, I shout down. Friends, I have an idea, and we do not have time to waste. I'm all ears, brother, Ahmed calls up. There is a moment of silence. Amir? Ahmed calls down. Yes, he replies weakly. I'm here, but I'm not in good shape. I'm going to be honest. It's okay, I shout forcing my own confidence to grow, believing in hope for us, for the sake of my friends, if not for myself. We'll be alright, just listen. I clear my throat, and the sound bounces off the pipe above me and back into my face. I raise my head to clear my ears from the water and wince from the pain. We need to move, I shout simply. We cannot stay here or we will die. Any further pressure changes and the pipe could fill with water to the brim. And regardless, sooner or later, we will use up all of the oxygen and we will suffocate. So I propose this. We do our best to move. We shuffle our way along the pipe as far as we can. If we're in luck, we've been pulled north. And I do not know how much distance we've already covered. Azrak 1 is only one and a half kilometers away max. That's a distance we can make. I'm sure of it. And if we've been pulled south, Amir calls. To this, I remain silent. The sound of something low and deep reverberates along the pipe. Then, shakily, Ahmed replies. All right, Kadar, I'm with you. We'll do this. We crawl our way along the pipe. And we pray. Amir? I call down. What do you think? He coughs and groans. Kadar, he says. Look, I, I can barely move. I can't do this. You can, Ahmed shouts down. You can. No, Ahmed. Amir groans again. Ahmed, my injuries are bad. I cannot move an inch. We can't leave you behind. Ahmed splutters, but Amir interrupts. Go, he says, and once you've escaped, you'll know where to find me. Just go, all right? You said yourselves, the clock is ticking, so go. I hesitate, then release a long, shuddering sigh. God save you, brother, I call down, 
We'll be back, I promise. We won't leave you. I know, he says, his voice distant and quiet. Damn, I mutter angrily, slamming my fist against the pipe. Ahmed, are you ready? There's a pause. Yes, he says. I'm right behind you, Gadar. Let's do this. And so, we begin our venture. Excruciatingly claustrophobic does not even begin to cover it. The knowledge that beyond these narrow confines is nothing more than the great weight of the ocean does not fill me with bravery. Every inch that we travel requires an exertion. I find little to no leverage on the wet, slippery, and oil-soaked base of the pipe. So, I have to find the slightest, narrowest of grooves, mostly around the upper half, and press my toes or heels into them, using my one good hand and my one broken hand to help force myself along through the sloshing, sinister waters. I can see nothing. There is no level of light at all for my eyes to adjust to, so in pitch darkness we remain. As we move, I try my best to keep track of the distance travelled. My estimate, I think, is reasonable after two or three meters. After ten, my grasp is feeble. And beyond that, I simply lose track. It's impossible to tell. We keep shuffling our way down the pipe, listening to the sounds of our breathing, occasionally calling down to each for reassurance, Ahmed and I. Slowly and steadily through this underwater pipe, inch by agonizing inch. It's tough to tell how much time passes, but after around 20 minutes, I make a disturbing discovery. It was gradual at first, so gradual that I did not notice, but there is now a significant stress placed on the back of my neck. I'm having to hold my face as high as I can and my forehead has been pressed against the metal for a while now. It is only when I have to alter the shape of my lips to inhale the air that I realize we are running out. I suppress a wave of panic and stop moving at once, shuffling back the way I came to give myself a little more airspace to work with. Water sloshes in my ears and obscures my hearing, but I call down to Ahmad. Ahmad, I call. Can you hear me? Yes, he shouts back, coughing. Everything all right? Ahmed, I falter. Ahmed, we're about to run out of air. There's a pause. What do you mean? He asks, his voice higher, more anxious. I mean, the air pocket is about to expire. Another pause. Maybe there's another further down, he says. I've seen the schematics of the pipe. The undulations are not regular, so there could be another pocket. What if there isn't? I shout back, chest now rising and falling desperately. Damn it, damn it. There is no space, no light. I can't breathe. Get a hold of yourself, Akuma shouts, and it cuts through the madness. I seize hold of his words and allow them to anchor me. We can do this, brother. I take a deep breath. All right, I say. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move as fast as I can along the pipe. I'll hold my breath, and I'll search for an air pocket. Regardless of whether I do or don't, I'll be back to let you know. Okay? You're a brave man, calls the voice of Ahmed. Don't overdo it. Good luck. Okay, I say, heart pounding. I begin to take a series of slow, deep breaths, gently and gradually expanding my lungs, preparing them to hold for as long as they are able. The sound is cold and eerie in the darkness. Steady, deep breaths. My chest rises and falls. I shuffle back along the pipe, my face pressed against the pipe the air metallic and oily and grim. I can't hear anything now. The water comes all the way up to the sides of my lips. 
Shaking, I pressed my hand against the side, doing my best to ignore the pain shooting through my right hand wrist. Here we go, Kadar. I take my final breath in, my lungs fill to their maximum capacity, and I brace myself against the pipe, using my hands and feet to push myself further along. The air is lost, and I am completely submerged beneath the water. It forms a constant, steady, roaring rumble in my ears. I use anything that I can to increase the distance I am able to move. My elbows, knees, heels, shoulders. I use all of them to search for leverage. Inch by inch, faster than before, I force myself through the pipe. My heart pounds. The beat is loud. So, so loud. My chest trembles, but I keep moving as far as I can. Inch by inch. Inch by inch. Don't panic. If I don't find air, then there's really nothing for us. We'll suffocate or drown or worse in the belly of the pipe and we may never be discovered. I have to keep moving, inch by inch. My hands reach a particularly oily section of the pipe and instead of pressing against the sides, they slip right off. In a blink, my momentum is lost and I fumble and splutter in terror as I realize that my means of propulsion has now failed me. No, I think with flashes of terrible urgency. No, no. Bubbles unseen escape from my lips as I writhe in the darkness, suffocating in the cold embrace of the rusted beast. Please, I beg, sending up prayers to a god I have neglected, desperately searching for a workable surface. My foot finds a subtle groove and I'm able to push myself another inch, and from there I'm able to move another. My journey continues, but I'm rewarded with no relief, because soon I will need to breathe in. My lungs have already begun to ache, and if I don't find another pocket of air, then I'll have to return through the pipe, back the way I came, back past the slippery, oily walls. What if I get stuck on my way back? What if I don't make it back in time? How the hell was this allowed to happen? I am overcome with a sudden burst of rage, and bubbles spill through my clenched teeth as I force myself deeper and deeper through the water, as hastily as I am able. My lungs start to burn, I am going to run out of air. Just a little further, I can search a little further. I'm going to run out of air. I'm going to die. Just a little further. I can do it. I can do it. And with a sudden gasp and a great shuddering breath inwards, I almost laugh in desperate thankfulness as the angle of the pipe is suddenly changed and I feel my face emerge into a fresh new pocket of air. It's not fresh of course, but in that moment is the sweetest air I've ever tasted. I come to a stop and allow some great and rasping breaths, filling and replenishing my lungs. Thank God, is all I can murmur over and over. Thank God, thank God. I calm myself, and once I have my breath, I try shouting. I don't think he'll be able to hear me, but I try anyway. I receive no response, so I try knocking a rhythm on the pipe. There is still no response. So, regretfully, I prepare for the return journey. I'm scared, of course, but I now know it can be done, that there is air waiting safely for me on the other side. So I fill my lungs once again and shuffle back through the pipe feet first this time, back towards Ahmed's location. I use the material of my diving suit to help me pass by the particularly oily section and emerge back into the former pocket, spluttering and coughing. Oh good lord, Ahmed shouts, Kadar, you took your damn time, 
I thought you might have... It's alright, I reply. We can make it. There's another pocket ahead. Now listen. And I go on to explain the distance and what he'll need to do. Then finally, for the third and hopefully final time, we force ourselves through the watery darkness back beneath and through the pipe with the promise of the next air pocket, our guiding light. Inch by inch, as fast as I can, praying that Ahmed is able to keep up. And then, as before, my face emerges welcomingly into the new air pocket, but I continue moving along to allow space for Ahmed. The seconds pass, and it's just as I'm beginning to fret that I hear his coughing, the sound of great lungfuls of swallowed air as he breathes in. Yes, I shout, banging my good fist on the pipe. We did it, we did it, brother. Yes, he splutters. Yes, we did. Then he releases what sounds like a laugh, and it fills my heart with hope. Come on, I shout to him. Let's keep going. And so we do and our journey through the pipe, inch by inch, as the hours pass by, the timeless hours in the perpetual, watery darkness. My joints ache, my muscles tense and throb with exertion, but I have to keep going, there's nothing else for it. Our air pocket comes to an end, and as with before, I scout ahead. I have to, of course, as there's simply no way possible for Ahmed to pass me by. After holding my breath for another painful period of time, I am blessed with the discovery of a new breathable space, and so we continue in the same manner. These air pockets, however, grow shorter and shorter as we progress much to my quiet alarm, but there's still just enough, and so our journey continues. Every time I have to hold my breath and go on ahead, it is a cruel exercise in willpower and mental strength, but I do my duty. I have to. We have to get out. We need to. An exhausting struggle through the pipe comes to a temporary halt as we reach an air pocket a mere three or four meters in length. I start with fright as my bad shoulder knocks up against something hard and cold. It moves in little response to the pressure I exert upon it, so it isn't a blockage of any kind. Could it be? My heart leaps, wriggling, squirming in the pipe. I do my best to bring my good hand up towards my head. It is not a quick process and requires some uncomfortable maneuvers, but eventually my hand can reach my neck and beyond, and my fingers explore the mysterious object. Despite everything, a grin spreads across my face and I cry out loud with joy. Ahmed, I shout. Ahmed, I found a tank. I think... Yes, it's all connected. It's all here. A tank? He replies. What do you mean? I mean an oxygen tank, Ahmed. It's all in one piece. The breathing tube. Yes, it's all here. That's fantastic, he exclaims. How many are there? My enthusiasm drops. I shuffle further down the pipe, searching blindly in the darkness for evidence of a potential second set of diving gear. Despite my silent pleas, however, there is only one. I can only find one here, I tell my comrade. But there might be another further down. This is a game changer. We can do this. We can get out. Whose tank is it, Kadar? Ahmed asks me. I think my own was about half full. Yes, likewise, I reply. What about Amir's? Amir's? Ahmed begins hesitating. Kadar, I think Amir's was almost empty. I take a deep breath. Right, 
I reply. Well, still, this will help. I'll use it now, and I'll see if I can find another set a little further along. Wish me luck. Good luck, man, Ahmed says. Godspeed. I check the tank over as best I can. I hold the mouthpiece around my lips, giving it a few test breaths. Then, on I go. Back beneath the water, though this time armed with the tank to help me along my way. I grunt and shift my body around, shuffling through the pipe, squirming my way along. And I find what will come to be the final air pocket of its type. A mere meter long, not even big enough for Ahmed and I to share at the same time. And to my growing frustration, there is no sign of a second tank. So, I push deeper, onwards through the pipe, breathing with the tank, pushing it along with me as I go. I discover, to my bitter amusement, what could well be my second missing flipper, but there is still no second tank, and no further air pockets either. Clenching my fist, I realize that I need to go back before Ahmed starts worrying, so I make the painstaking return journey in a time that to my friend must have felt like hours. But at last, I return to our shared location and inform him of the disappointing news. He is quiet as I relay my findings, and then he says in a soft voice, Kadar, I think that this is the end of the road for me. There is no use in me going any further. I think that I'll have to wait here. I begin to protest, but my words die in my mouth. What is there for me to say? He's right, of course. It's a harsh truth, but he's absolutely right. He'll simply have to stay behind. The next leg of the journey, I'll have to do alone. A sudden rush of emotion swells up inside me, and I force it back down. There's a time and a place. I try not to consider the fact that this may be the last time I ever hear his voice. Perhaps I've heard both their voices for the very last time. No, time and a place. Keep moving. Ahmed, I begin, fumbling for some words that'll do the moment justice. But he interrupts. See you soon, buddy, he says in the dark. I'm not able to reply immediately, but when I do, I say to him, Yes, for sure. See you soon, buddy. And with that, I'm gone. I force myself further along the tank, crawling and shuffling, and I am submerged. My breathing is loud to the tube connected to my mouth, and when I reach the final air pocket, I allow myself a second to pause, to steal my constitution. And then this pocket too is left behind. On I go, underwater. The rest of my journey will be underwater, and since I cannot see, there is no way to tell how much air is left in the tank. If it was mine or Ahmed's, then I should have hours to spare. If it was Amir's, well, no point in being coy. If it's Amir's then, I'll likely die down here, unless I'm blessed with another surprise air pocket. It's not impossible, I tell myself as I crawl through the pipe, water all around me. It's not impossible. And yet... As the hours go by, there are no more air pockets to discover, just more pipe, the endless claustrophobic dark of the tunnel. How far have I come? No idea, impossible to tell really, and I don't even know which way I'm heading. If it's north, then there's hope, if south, then this whole venture was pointless anyway. I'll never make it back to Azrak 2, Azrak 1 on the other hand, for Azrak 1, hope remains. 
there's still hope. Onwards through the pipe, to the oily, poison water. My elbows burn with pain from the friction. My shoulders have been rubbed raw. My feet are developing painful blisters from the places I've been forced to press them against the pipe for leverage over and over. My neck is killing me. It hurts to turn my head too far in either direction. I just grip my teeth and keep on going. Too late to stop now. Must keep going. On and on and on. God give me strength, I mutter to myself as my muscles contract and sting. Give me strength to see this through. Thinking about Ahmed, about Amir, all alone, just like me, it helps propel me forward. I can't give up, not while they're counting on me. I can never do that to them, not ever. So on I go. Endless, ceaseless dark. Endless, ceaseless torture of the pipe. Except, it's not endless. Not as luck would have it. The good news regarding my oxygen tank is that it definitely wasn't Amir's. If it was, it would have expired by now. The bad news is that I've been needing deeper and deeper breaths to fill my lungs. And soon, the oxygen that the tank can spare me just won't be enough. It won't go on forever. I have found no other tanks along my journey. It's just the one on my person currently. And then, that's it. Game over. Come on, you pipe. I hiss through the mouthpiece. You can't go on forever. You can't. And of course, it doesn't. My head bashes against hard metal. Eh? I murmur in confusion. I try to continue along my journey, but the way is blocked. I simply cannot go any further. My first thought is one of panic. I fear that I've reached some kind of wall in the pipe, one that shouldn't exist, that I've come all this way to find nothing more than a dead end. Upon little inspection, however, I realize that a space has opened up above my head. I squirm around, and for the first time in hours and hours, I'm able to change positions and to sit upright. My back cracks, and a rush of unbelievable relief in muscle tension flows through me. I bring up my hands to feel around me in the darkness, and I almost shout for joy. The pipe has reached this end. It's going up now, vertically, up through the sea towards the surface. We came north, I laugh, the cracks of hope widening, flowing into me like rivers of silver. We've been traveling north the whole time, the end of the pipe, upwards to the installation at Azraquan, and to salvation. Unless... I take stock and consider the choice that now faces me. If I'm going to push onwards, then this really is it. It's a coin flip for life or death. There's not much air left in the tank, and if I climb this pipe to discover the worst, if the pipe has been stoppered or plugged, then definitively for me, there will be no way out. I really will reach a dead end. All hope will be lost, and I will drown down here with nowhere to go. No way forwards and no way back. I shake my head. There's no choice here, not really. It's just willpower. I don't have enough air in my tank to get back to Ahmed even if I wanted to. It's only forwards, forwards and upwards. All right. I murmur, bubble spilling. Here we go. And I begin my slow, deliberate ascent. Back pressed against the pipe behind me, knees and calves against the pipe in front. Up I go, kicking at times, half swimming, half shimmying, up the pipe, up the pipe to the surface. Slowly but surely, 
grimacing through the strain and the pain. And still, so dark, so unbelievably dark. The lack of light does not fill me with confidence. If the pipe was not stoppered, surely I'll be able to see some light, right? I open my eyes in the water. The salt and oil stings like hell, but I need to see, or to try and see at least. But there's nothing. There's no hint of light at all. Don't lose faith, I tell myself, screwing my eyes shut again. Keep going, keep going. This vertical section of pipe is unlike the one we were stuck down. This part here goes all the way up to the surface, up to the bustle and the relative commotion of Azraquan. Except it won't be bustling right now, of course. I hesitate, taking a deep, strained breath through the mouthpiece, grunting with the strain. Thinking about it, the place could be entirely deserted. I don't even know what time it is. I've been crawling through the pipe for hours upon hours. I'm not sure of the exact time, but I'm exhausted, I'm starving, and my oxygen is about to expire. If I recall correctly, in fact, the site won't even be open tomorrow. I rack my brains and try to remember. When were they all off-site? Was it tomorrow or the day after? Damn, what if everyone's gone back to shore? What if the site is empty? What if there's no one to hear me? What if the pipe is stoppered? What if... what if... I bellow in frustration and continue my ascent. Each breath becomes hard work. I'm starting to feel lightheaded, but there's nowhere to go but up. This section of pipe can't be longer than 80 meters or so. So surely, if it was open, I'd see the light, right? Wouldn't I see the light? Please, I whisper as I open my eyes again, squinting through the darkness, terrified that at any second I will hit a barrier or a stop, and my journey will come to an abrupt and bitter end. Any second, at any moment, I could strike the ceiling, and I'll be trapped. In the very next second, I emerge from the water. I hear the sounds of splashing as my head breaks free of the surface. I'm still in complete darkness, but I've reached the top. Air. I pull off the mouthpiece and suck it all down, refilling my lungs with far greater ease, rubbing and brushing the oily waters from my face and eyes. I made it, I say to no one in particular, my voice echoing around the narrow little space afforded me. Now, I have to come to perhaps the final hurdle. How cruel it would be, I think. How cruel to make it so far, and then to be denied rescue. So close, and yet so far. I squirm and bring up my good arm with my good hand. I reach it above me, feeling through the darkness as the water spills and drips from my elbow. A few inches above my head, I feel the lid of the pipe, screwed tight shut. My heart starts pounding again. Come on, please, please. I search desperately for a release mechanism or a valve that will open the pipe from the inside. But alas, just as I suspected, there is no such valve. I bring up my other hand and try to force open the lid. I try to spin it, to shift it, but nothing works, nothing at all, and there will be no one on the other side. Why would there be? Their shift is over. They'll have left the site by now, crossed back to the shore. I'm stuck. After everything, I'm just as trapped as Amir and as Ahmed. I started pounding desperately on the lid. I bang the pipe as hard as I can. I start to scream. I start shouting, though the sounds will be muffled. From the outside, my shouts for help would just sound like a load of moaning and groaning potentially even mistaken for the general rumble of the pipe itself. Help! I scream, 
slamming both fists on the metal with all my remaining force, not caring for the spikes of pain that shoot through my broken wrist. Panic threatens to overtake me. Now, at this final stage of my journey, Help! I cry, slamming the lid, kicking the pipe, making as much noise as I am able before my constitution breaks. Anyone? I roar into the darkness, and with the sound of a grate and sudden grinding directly above my head, the lid shifts, and a curved crack of light spills blindingly into the pipe. I gasp with astonishment, the wind taken from my sails, and I slump back down into the water with a splash. My eyes are forced closed, and the world beyond my sealed eyelids is a dazzling orange-red. I don't even know what to say. I'm too afraid to believe what is happening. I sense someone talking to me. The voice is confused and alarmed. They grab me by the diving suit, by the shoulders, and with some considerable degree of effort, they haul me out and onto the platform that surrounded the pipe's exit. I'm unable to help myself from weeping. I still cannot see, but the tears streak the salt and the oil from my face. I've never felt so free. I turn and wince and stretch my arms and legs in ways that they were unable for what felt like ages. I feel a hand squeeze my shoulder, a bottle of cool, refreshing, and above all, clean water is gently poured over my face. Kadar, comes a familiar voice. Kadar, what on earth? He fumbles for words. Care to explain yourself, Kadar? What the hell is this? I finally manage to open my eyes, just a sliver. Gradually, painfully adjusting to the light from the flood lamps all around. And I am greeted by the sight of the only employee still at his station, long after his shift has come to an end. He stares at me, his scruffy red hair and his beard a mess, his expression almost comical in confusion. A dry chuckle escapes my lips. Hello, sir, here, I mutter. You know... I don't think I've ever been happier to see anyone in my entire life. And this, my friends, is the truth. The hours that followed passed by in a whirlwind. The company and the authorities were alerted immediately, and the helicopters were sent up into the sky, and rescue boats were out in the water within the hour. The ruined habitat site was investigated and safely secured. Vast teams of divers were sent down, and they traversed the entire length of the pipe, way into the night, knocking and tapping on the metal, and hunting diligently for Amir and Ahmad. Knocking and tapping on the metal, and hunting diligently for Amir and Ahmad. There was, tragically, no response. I remember pacing up and down in one of the control rooms, fielding calls from family in the presence of several officers and officials as the pressure in the pipe was carefully leveled, as it was disconnected at the safest point and open for inspection. I remember the way I reacted when I was told the news the next morning. After a long and sleepless night, arm bandaged. I remember the breath escaping me. I remember collapsing into the nearest chair. That's impossible, I murmured. There's no way. But the bodies of Amir and Ahmad were discovered together about ten or so meters north from where we were suckered down. It was ruled that the two men died on impact with the pipe almost instantaneously. It's likely they weren't even aware of what happened. Their last conscious moments, I am told, most probably took place in the habitat itself, before the disaster. To this, I say nothing. I simply look out of the window as the morning sun reflects and glimmers, sparkling 
in the gentle waves of the sea far below. My father was not an open book. Those that knew him would call him a reserved man, or a man of few words. But to me, he was like a man who had retreated into his own universe. A world that seemed filled with shadows in every corner. A waking nightmare. I would catch him sometimes at night, just staring out the window, gripping the arms of his chair so tight I thought his hands would start bleeding. He would lean forward, almost falling out of his chair, as if expecting something terrible and incomprehensible to show up at our door at any moment. My father was a man clothed in dread. It's only something I came to realize as I got older. He hid it well, especially from my mother. Not nearly well enough. Nothing terrified my father more than piano music. Whether it was heard in an elevator or on the TV or being played in a shopping mall by a hobby pianist who wanted to impress onlookers. Whether it was classical or jazz. Whether it was happy or sad, simple or complex. When he heard the sound of a piano... His eyes would bulge out of their sockets. His skin would go pale white. He would look around wildly, whipping his head back and forth like a dog wrangling with a bone. I never had the courage to ask him why he was so afraid of it. Why didn't I just ask him? But it wasn't a thing to be acknowledged in our home. Fear is contagious, and the easiest way to come down with it is to talk about it. So, my father's fear lingered throughout our lives, untouched, like a piano that was never sold. It just hung in the air, playing its own silent music for years. My father passed away a year ago due to heart complications. I thought his secret died with him. But two weeks ago, I was visiting my mom and decided to go through my father's old belongings. I guess I was feeling nostalgic. After some time, I was about to head out, when I saw it. At the bottom of a cardboard box that had been hidden in the corner of the attic, it was an unmarked envelope. Inside was a letter comprised of several sheets of paper, the writing on the letter was rushed and scratchy, but it was my father's handwriting. There was no mistaking it. What I read in that letter has haunted me for the past 14 days. I've decided to share that letter, right here and now, because I feel that in some way it may help me better understand it. Or maybe the truth is, I just want someone to share my father's dread with. My mother would not listen to me when I told her about the letter. She told me to burn it and to forget whatever it said. She scolded me like I was still a child. What you are about to hear from this point on are my father's words exactly. I have not changed nor altered any of it. I am transcribing it word for word. This is my father's story, in his own words. I wonder how many times I've attempted to write this letter, how many pieces of paper I've torn up throughout the years, how many pens have gone dry, how many pencils snapped. Too many, far too many. If I do have the courage to finish it, I wonder who will even read it. Maybe it'll be my dear Elizabeth. Maybe you're even reading it right now. I'm sorry for keeping this from you. I haven't been a good husband. You don't know all of me. Not nearly all of me. That's a horrible thing to do to your wife. I hope you can forgive me, Liz. Or maybe 
It'll be you, Jack, my boy. You saw me better than I saw myself. How many times did you catch me staring? I used to tell you I was daydreaming. If you are reading this, now you'll know what I really saw those nights. What I heard. Or maybe it's neither Elizabeth or Jack. Maybe it's you, Jonathan, or your mother. God help me if it is. Have you finally found me? I've seen you out of the corner of my eyes for the last 40 years. Or maybe, if you're reading this, you're a complete stranger to me. Regardless, it's time I told this story once and for all. Even if the pen and paper I'm writing with end up being the only ones who ever know it. In December of 1976, I was on my way home for the holidays. I was attending the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My parents lived in La Crosse. It's only about a two and a half hour drive, but on my way, I got caught in a snowstorm. A storm that came out of nowhere. I mean really came out of nowhere. Somehow, I got turned around. I have never been good at driving in snow. If you're reading this, Liz, you know how true that is. Remember the station wagon? God, I nearly crashed it a hundred times. Those were good days. On days like those, I barely ever heard the piano, or at least convinced myself I couldn't hear it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This was not a bad storm. It was one hell of a bad storm. I've rolled back the clock in my head numerous times, wondering if there was anything I could have done differently. What if I had driven slower or turned into the slide? But I think, in some ways, no matter what I did, that car was destined to crash that day. And crash it, I did. Straight into a ditch. All my attempts to get the car out of the ditch were futile. Snow was coming down hard. This was no soft powder, but a cacophony of flakes and harsh sleet. Through the white storm, I saw a house in the distance. It was the only building nearby, and I hadn't seen any cars on the road in what felt like forever. I got out of my car and walked towards the home. I was shocked by how deep the snow had become already, how unrecognizable the landscape seemed. I took one last look at my car, already being devoured by the snow, turning it into a sad frozen white monolith in the middle of nowhere. I drew closer and closer to the home, each step I took more tiresome than the last. Then I heard something that stopped me right in my tracks. It was the sound of music coming from the home. It was the delicate sound of a piano. The music cut right through the harsh cold winds of the storm and went straight to my ears. The music was coming from the upper part of the house. There was a window to a room on the upper floor, but a curtain obstructed the view. Still, there was no question that the piano music was coming from that room. My eyes went from the top window to a window on the first floor. There was a woman standing in the window. She was staring right at me with a bemused expression on her face. I waved to her nervously and then pointed back at my car. When I looked back, the woman was gone from the window. Moments later, the front door to the house opened and I made my way up the porch steps. Can I help you? The woman asked, standing in the doorway. She still had that bemused look on her face. It's a little embarrassing, I said. But I crashed my car into that ditch down the road, and I can't get out. Oh my, how awful, the woman said. Please, come in and get yourself warm. I stepped inside, and the woman shut the door behind me. All at once, the noise from outside was cut off. The only noise now was the piano music coming from upstairs. That 
and my chilled breathing. That music, I said, rubbing my arms to get warm. It's really lovely. Oh, that's my son, Jonathan. He's a wonderful pianist. Please, do make yourself comfortable. I'll fix you some tea. Absolutely dreadful weather. Simply dreadful. I sat down in the living room. It was a warm and cozy house. But there was something underneath that made me uncomfortable. I did not understand it fully at the time. But looking back on it, I believe some part of me noticed all the little things that were off about the home. For one, there was no family photos anywhere to be seen, and despite the warmth of the home, it had a bizarre, sterile smell, like that of an appliance store. The house looked lived in, but didn't feel lived in. Could I use your phone? I asked. The phones are out, the woman said, bringing back two cups of tea. They won't be back up until morning, most likely. Soon as they are, I'll phone Harvey, my neighbor. He lives the closest. I'll have him bring his tractor, and we'll get your car out of the ditch. Is there any way to get hold of him now? I hate to be a bother, but I was on my way to lacrosse to see my folks for the holidays. I was hoping to get there by tonight. Upstairs, the piano music stopped. The woman took a large sip of her tea, looking at me over the cup with her faded green eyes. Then, putting the cup down gently, she said, Lacrosse? Goodness gracious, how on earth did you end up here in Dutchville County? I got turned around. Dutchville County? I've never been through here before. Well, there's no helping it now. Harvey lives a spell away. Unfortunately, you'll have to wait until morning, dear. I'm terribly sorry. Your son, Jonathan. How old is he? Twenty next month, she said fondly. Oh, well, could he... Then again, I hate to be a bother. Could he help me try to push my car out? No, she said flatly, and there was no kind of bemusement in her voice now. Her eyes narrowed. Jonathan cannot move all that well. Even if he could, and even if you did get your car out, the roads are terrible. You'll just be in another ditch in no time. You're perfectly fine to sleep on the couch tonight. Come tomorrow, Harvey will have you out, and you'll be on your way to see your parents. I realized. I guess it has to be that way then. I realized I'd not taken a drink of my tea. But looking at the cup, I lost all thirst. The tea looked like gross mud water that had been pulled from a gutter. For some time, we just sat there in the quiet living room. With no music, a dreary silence took over the home. Where are you coming from, anyhow? The woman said, putting down her empty teacup. It felt as if an eternity had just passed. I go to school in Madison. Oh, how lovely. What are you studying? Engineering. How wonderful. You know Jonathan used to love engineering as a boy, even more than playing the piano. He would always build things, little trinkets and gadgets and gizmos. But his condition made it impossible for him to pursue a higher education. He's been a homebody for years now. All he does is play piano day and night. He's really great at it. Oh, where are my manners? I should introduce you both. At that, she led me out the living room. We began to climb the stairs. As we did, a horrible feeling came over me. The one you might have when you're walking by a dark alley at night. The kind of primitive instinct that screams in the back of your head. Screams, run you idiot, run. We reached the top of the stairs. The hallway was dark and lit only by a small lamp. We passed several rooms until we reached the door at the end of the hallway. The woman, and I realized at this point I didn't even know her name, gently pushed the door open and said, 
Jonathan, there's someone here I'd like you to meet. The first thing I noticed when stepping into the room was a large piano that sat in the corner. It was a beautiful looking piano and it looked out of place in the small room. A piano like that should have been front and center at a concert hall. The fading light outside filtered through the bedroom curtain, giving the room a soft, ethereal look. I felt I was stepping into some kind of dream world. And then I saw Jonathan sitting on his bed. I froze. I wouldn't call Jonathan a doll exactly. He was too big to be a doll. But he was like a rag doll in a way. A human sized rag doll. Jonathan was not a living, breathing person. He was just an inanimate object, dressed up to look human. He wore sky blue pajamas and had a mop of red hair. His cloth skin looked like it had been white once, but now had faded to a sickly beige color. He had two black buttons for eyes, though they were different sizes, the right eye being much smaller than the left. It gave him the appearance that he was always winking. I did what I could only do in that moment. I laughed. It was a hoarse, nervous laugh. Don't you dare laugh, the woman said sharply. She wasn't looking at me now. She was staring out the window, one hand rubbing Jonathan's inanimate leg in a soothing gesture. Oh, how they love to laugh. Once, Jonathan was sitting on the porch, just minding his own business, when these horrible boys from town came in and began to harass him. I'll never forget the sound of their laughter as I chased them off on their bikes. Oh, but I got the last laugh. Those boys loved to bike around a certain part of town, and one day, one of them went over some nasty gravel and hit his head. He's still in the hospital. Oh yes, I got the last laugh. I'm sorry, I said in a dry, panicked voice. Apology accepted, the woman said, turning to me. She had a shocked look on her face. Then she gave me a shark's grin. A thought then hit me like an arrow striking the center of a target. So chilling was the thought that I felt I might faint at any moment. My body felt ten times heavier. When the woman and I had been downstairs, someone had been playing piano music. Someone else had to be up here. Obviously, Jonathan playing was out of the question. Had to be out of the question. The thought of this grotesque ragdoll being alive went against everything I believed in. I looked around the room for a radio or record player, anything that might have been playing the music earlier. But there was nothing of the sort. There was only the piano. Is there anyone else in the house? I asked. The woman gave me a knowing smile and said, of course not, it's just Jonathan and I. Jonathan continued to stare into the distance with his misshapen button eyes. For a split second, maybe even less than that, I thought I saw his head move ever slightly. I blinked and rubbed my eyes. When I opened, Jonathan was as still as he had been and the woman was walking past me. I'll go fix your bed downstairs, she said, walking out of the room. You'll need your rest for tomorrow. Then, she was gone. Only Jonathan and I were left in the room that began to fill with an awful silence. So pervasive and relentless was the silence that it felt as if it seeped into every pore of my body. None of this could be real, I told myself. The woman was playing a trick on me, had to be playing a nasty trick on me. I once again looked over the room, hoping, nearly begging God to show me a radio or a record player, but there was nothing. 
I thought about approaching Jonathan, give him a real look over. But one look at that horrible, winking eye was enough to convince me otherwise. I quickly turned and began to walk out of the room. Then I heard what sounded like something shifting in the bed behind me, and I ran. Within seconds, I was down the stairs and out the front door. I knew it was suicide running out into that storm, but I couldn't stay in that house a second longer. The snow was so deep, it slowed my running, and for a horrible moment, I imagined Jonathan chasing after me, gaining on me with terrible, inhuman speed, his ragdoll limbs moving in strange, unnatural motions. I heard the woman yelling after me, yelling for me to come back. Then, I heard two horrible sounds. The first was that the woman was laughing. Even in the roar of the winds, her laugh was unmistakable, piercing even. I turned and saw her on the front porch. She did in fact have a horrible grin on her face, which now looked so much longer and paler than it had before. Her laugh was an awful cackle like thin ice breaking. The second horrible thing I heard was the sound of a piano being played. It was coming from Jonathan's room. My car was nowhere in sight, but it was no use to me now anyway. I ran down the road, and eventually the woman's laugh faded, but not the piano music. No matter how far I went, I could still hear it. It followed me the way a bad memory follows you. I don't know how long I waded through the snow, but at some point I collapsed and thought for sure I was going to die. Then I saw a light coming towards me. That light eventually turned into a tractor with a plow. There was a man driving it. He got out and began to say something, but I couldn't hear him. I was fading in and out of consciousness. The last thing I saw before I blacked out was the man standing over me, a horrible, concerned look on his face. The last thing I heard was piano music. I woke up the next morning in an unfamiliar bed. For a horrifying second, I thought I was back in that woman's house maybe sleeping in the very same bed as Jonathan. But that wasn't the case. I was in an unfamiliar room, alone. Sunlight was shining through the window, and I could see that the storm had stopped. I heard the floorboards creaking outside the room, and again, for a horrifying second, I thought the woman would appear in the doorway, smiling, cackling, Instead, it was the man I had seen driving the tractor. Good, you're awake, the man said warmly. How are you feeling? Where am I? I asked, ignoring his question. You're in my house. I found you running down the road last night. What were you thinking? My car broke down. Are you with that woman? What woman? That one that lives down the road from where you found me. The man said nothing at first. He just stared at me. Then he said in a pensive voice, The woman that lives down the road from where I found you? Are you with her? I said. I gripped the bed sheets as if my life depended on it. No, I'm not with anyone. The man said, putting up his hands. I live here on my own. I relaxed my hands. I need to call my parents. I was on my way to visit them when my car broke down. Phone's in the kitchen. You're welcome to use it. When you were out, I was plowing the roads. I saw a car. Your car, I gather. We can go there when you're ready and get it out. I've already got most of it plowed out truthfully. If you saw my car, then you must have seen the house nearby. That's the house where the woman lives, with her son Jonathan. He's not... 
the house where the woman lives? The man said again, in that deep, pensive voice. Yeah, you must have seen it if you saw my car. Why don't you call your parents? And if you're up for it, I'll take you to your car. He gave me a reassuring smile, then got up to leave. Is your name Harvey? I asked him. He turned around, and the smile on his face dipped into a questioning frown. Is it? It is, he said. How do you know that? The woman, she told me about you and your tractor. Is that right? For a moment, Harvey said nothing. His frown deepened. Call your parents, and then we'll get going. He left me in the room, with the sunlight as my only company. My parents were relieved to hear my voice. I didn't tell them about what I saw in the woman's house. That already was starting to feel like a bad nightmare. I told them that my car went into a ditch and that I spent that night at a kind stranger's house and that I would be in Madison later that day, hopefully. I got into the tractor with Harvey and as we drove down the road, I was shocked to see how much of the road had already been cleared. The storm had been so awful the night before and the snow had been so deep. Now, it barely looked as if it had snowed. Eventually, we came upon my car. Harvey had told the truth. He had gotten most of it out of the snow already. He killed the engine to his tractor, and both our eyes went in the same direction. We were looking at where the house was, or where it should have been. There was no house there now, at least not what I had seen last night. Instead, there were the remains of a house. The roof was gone, and part of the floor was completely caved in. Bits and pieces of the home jutted out like the jagged teeth of some ancient monster. Is this the house you were speaking of? Harvey asked. His voice was soft and empathetic. I don't understand, I said. I was here last night. I was in there. It wasn't like this. Son, that house has been abandoned for years now. There was a woman who lived there, but that was a long time ago. What happened to her? It was a long time ago. You couldn't have met what happened. She took her own life. Harvey said. As he spoke, we both stared at the wreckage of the home. After our son died, it was a terrible accident involving some of the boys from town. I don't know too much about the details. I was young myself back then. I just know that it was ugly business and that she blamed one of the boys for her son's death. The boy ended up in the hospital sometime later. I don't know much else. Like I said, it was ugly business, but that house has been abandoned for years. No one lives there. No one could live there. Just look at the state of it. So you were just pulling my leg right? You couldn't have been in there last night. Tell me you were just pulling my leg. I stared into Harvey's eyes, which were now threatening to spill over with tears, and saw that the old man was in fact terrified. Yeah, I was just pulling your leg, I said flatly. Someone from town told you my name. His voice thin, pleading. Someone from town put you up to it. Someone in town told me your name. Someone from town put me up to it. Harvey let out a sigh. Well, you got me good, son. Oh boy, yeah you did. Now, let's get your car out. It did not take long for Harvey and I to get my car out and running. We shook hands and I thanked him for his help. As I was getting in my car and Harvey was getting in his tractor, we both stopped at the sound 
of something horrifying. It was coming from the abandoned home. It was piano music. Delicate, melancholic piano music. We stood there and just listened. Neither of us acknowledged it. Then, after a moment, we got in our vehicles and went our separate ways. I never saw or spoke with Harvey again, but I've heard the piano music every night since. I'm hearing it now as I write this letter. God help me. I'm hearing it now. That's the end of my father's letter. I still can't quite believe what I've read. That my father really wrote these words. At least now, I understand why my father spent his life looking over his shoulder. What he saw in the shadows. Since reading his letter, I've had this idea in my head of driving up to Dutchville County and try to find the house that haunted my father every step of his life. But I'm terrified of what I'll see and what I'll hear. My older brother, Shane, had spent the last 10 years in prison and it looked like he might be in there for the rest of his life. However, he called me recently to say that they were opening up a new early release program and they would let him out immediately on a probationary period if he agreed to participate. Some sort of new process, an ethical alteration to prevent future criminal activity. God, how I wish now that he had just told them no. Growing up, Shane was my hero. My mom has had a rough life. She got pregnant with Shane when she was 16 and her parents kicked her out of the house for it. Afterwards, she went to live with Shane's father, who was in his early 20s and had a small apartment in the worst part of the city and he treated her terribly, forcing her to drop out of school and get several jobs so he could spend the majority of his time drinking and partying, hitting her whenever she stepped out of line. But she was terrified of raising a baby alone. She tried her best to make it work with him, but it just wasn't enough. When she started showing, he realized that he didn't want to be a dad and kicked her out too. Faced with the prospect of living on the streets, she lied about her age and managed to secure a lease from a landlord in a nearby building that preferred not to ask questions as long as she paid the rent. When Shane was born, she did her best. As she was only 17 and without an education beyond the 10th grade, she continued to work multiple minimum wage jobs and didn't have much time to spend with a new son. Until he was around six, Shane mostly stayed with an older widow, Roberta, that lived across the hall from them and was sympathetic to their situation. Then, Roberta died, and Mom decided that Shane was old enough to just stay at home alone while she was working, or increasingly, staying out late with her friends or on dates. Mom fell hard into drugs and drinking to cope with the situation and took comfort in the worst men. None of them ever stuck around for more than a few months, but even still, many of them left their mark on my mother and on Shane. Coming of age in this environment of loneliness, poverty and violence, Shane was a troubled child. He was constantly in detention at school, getting in fights with other kids, stealing and generally raising hell around the neighborhood. That is, until I came along. One of mom's short-lived flings resulted in a second pregnancy, another boy, and I was born a little over two months after Shane's 12th birthday. Seeing that she wasn't going to change her ways overnight and become mother of the year, 
he took it upon himself to be my primary parental figure. He changed my diapers, did the weekly shopping, fed me, bathed me, cooked, cleaned. He did everything that he could to make my childhood better than his had been. It became his mission in life to be the father that neither of us had ever had. At school, he opened up a little bootleg shop out of his locker where he'd sell candy, trading cards, snacks, and once he was in high school, cigarettes and liquor, just to make a little extra money to buy me clothes and toys. And then, when he turned 16, he took a job at a local auto shop, working on cars in the evening after classes to help pay the rent and our other bills. I never understood where he found the energy to do it all. It was around this time that I started school myself. He packed my lunch every day and made sure that I got on the bus in the morning. With his supplemental income, mom was able to quit one of her jobs to be home to get me off the bus at the end of the day and to make dinner at night. Now, I'm not sure if he said something to her or if it was just her seeing him picking up so much of a slack, but she began to sober up a little and made more of an effort to be a mother to me than she had with him. It was too late for her to repair much of her relationship with Shane, but I began not to dread the time that I had to spend alone with her. After he graduated, Shane went to work full time as a mechanic in the shop and started making decent money. With his grades, he could have gone to college, moved away and studied something interesting, made something of himself, but it wasn't even a thought in his mind. His dream was for me to go to college, for me to grow up and do something important. All he wanted to do was save up enough money that he could buy us all a small place out in the suburbs and put me through school. So, he continued to work his ass off, and mom picked up more hours too. They both put money away each month into our future fund, and I ended up having a largely normal childhood while we counted down the days until we could get out of our crappy apartment. We didn't have much, but we had each other, and that was enough. And just when it looked like we were finally going to be able to make it happen, Something terrible happened. When I was 14, Shane got arrested. He was always looking for opportunities to make extra cash, to help us save up faster and start a new life. And his boss, Mr. Franks, would give him side work sometimes. Mostly, this involved him driving one of the cars from the shop and dropping off or picking up a package here or there. He never knew what was in these packages, nor did he care to ask, but he was always well compensated for his efforts. Then, one night, Mr. Franks told him that he had a slightly different assignment. Shane was to drive an associate of Mr. Franks to a house, drop him off, wait for him to come back out, and then take him right back to where he picked him up originally. That was all the information Shane had but it seemed like a simple enough task, and he would be making double his normal fee for doing it. So, he agreed. Things went alright for the first half of the evening. Shane picked up Mr. Franks' friend at the address Mr. Franks supplied, and the man gave him directions on where to go. They didn't speak beyond him grunting, Go left here, right here, take the next exit, at Shane every so often and they never exchanged names. It was a little over an hour before he directed Shane to kill the headlights and pull into the driveway of a home well outside the city. The man gave him strict instructions to stay inside the vehicle and leave the engine running in case they needed to make a quick getaway before exiting and slinking nimbly towards the house. At this point, Shane was apprehensive. He debated simply leaving the man behind and driving back to the city. Yet, he knew the money was going to be enough to put us over the edge and we'd finally be able to get our house. 
So, he sat quietly and waited, telling himself that the man was just breaking in to steal something or maybe take some compromising photos of someone. But, with the windows down, Shane heard something that made his stomach drop. Several quick pops came from inside the house, and Shane looked up to see flashes of light in the upstairs window corresponding with them. Gunshots. Shane panicked. He threw on the headlights and tried to turn the car around as quickly as he could. No amount of money was worth him getting involved in whatever he was currently involved in, and he was just ready to punch the accelerator and fly out the driveway when a loud bang on the passenger door made him jump. The man was wrenching the door open forcefully and dove into the seat, screaming at Shane to drive and get us the hell out of here. Seeing no other options, Shane obliged and whipped back out on the road while the man kept yelling expletives. Shane realized that he was in severe pain, and when they passed under a street lamp, he saw that the man was clutching his stomach and his hands were covered in blood. Damn it, asshole shot me. Damn it, I'm losing a lot of blood. I'm not feeling too good. His voice was faltering with each word he spoke, and he suddenly slumped over against the window. Shane tried to shake him, told him to wake up, but he got no response. Not knowing what to do, he searched for the nearest hospital on his phone and followed the directions to it. He parked on the curb near the emergency entrance and dragged the man inside, announcing loudly that he'd been shot and needed help. Several doctors and nurses helped load the man onto a gurney and wheeled him away into surgery while they started asking Shane questions about him. What's his name? How old is he? How was he shot? Shane couldn't give them any answers. He was in somewhat of a state of shock and his mind wasn't processing information quickly enough. He couldn't think of a believable reason on the spot for why he had a man that had been shot in his vehicle and simply opted to tell them that he didn't know and asked if he could leave. They told him that because he'd brought in a gunshot victim he'd have to wait to speak with the police and handed him off to hospital security. While he waited for the officers to arrive, he thought of calling Mr. Franks, but he couldn't get away from security to have a private conversation, so he just sat quietly and tried to think of a good story. What he came up with was that he'd been driving nearby when the man flagged him down at an intersection and Shane had simply pulled over to help only to realize that the man was gravely injured. It might have been flimsy, but he didn't think they'd have any way to prove otherwise and just hoped he'd have a chance to speak to the man before the cops did so they could cooperate each other. However, it didn't matter much what excuse Shane came up with as he was arrested as soon as the officers arrived before he could even give his weak fabrication. It turned out the house Shane and the man had gone to belonged to a detective, had been investigating Mr. Franks for drug smuggling. Shane had unknowingly driven the man to an execution, and the execution had gone horribly wrong. The detective heard their car pull into his driveway and was armed and waiting when the man broke into his bedroom. They'd exchanged several shots with one another and the detective had been fatally hit in the head while his wife took a round to the chest. The executioner must have thought she was dead, or was so flustered at having been shot himself that he didn't make sure she was gone before leaving the house. She'd been able to call 911 and explain what happened before expiring herself. Given she told them that her husband managed to shoot their attacker, the police had been put on high alert for any gunshot wounds arriving at local hospitals and when they relayed this information to Shane as they arrested him, he broke down and confessed to the whole thing. Unfortunately for Shane, the executioner didn't make it. Shane tried to explain to the officers that he had no idea what was going to happen when they drove to the house, but they wouldn't hear any of it. Mr. Franks was arrested too, but he of course had an alibi for the night 
and they couldn't find any evidence to tie him to hiring the men. What's worse, Mr. Franks tried to pin the whole thing on Shane. As Mr. Franks explained it to the police, he had complained to his employee that the deceased detective had been annoying him and making his business difficult. He had no idea that Shane would try to kill him over it. The evidence showed that Shane had been driving the car and there was nothing forensically to tie him to actually being in the house or having pulled the trigger, so they charged him with accessory to murder. With his word against Mr. Franks and no hard evidence either way, they didn't believe they could prove that Shane had indeed planned the whole thing, but they could definitely prove that he helped the murderer kill a detective and his wife in cold blood. They threw the book at him. We spent all the money that we had on his defense, even though he tried to tell us not to. But no matter how much we worked to argue that Shane hadn't a clue what he was doing that night, we couldn't prove it, and the court wanted to see justice for such a heinous crime. He was given a sentence of 30 years to life and hauled off to the state penitentiary with us barely having time to say goodbye. For the next 10 years, I visited him as often as possible, and he called me whenever they'd let him. Mum and I had ended up destitute again after the trial, and our hopes of moving on to better things were dashed. She fell back into her old ways, and I was left with the burden of trying to keep us both afloat. Worse than she was before, she wasn't able to hold down steady work, and I had to take on several jobs to pay our bills. No matter her faults, she was still my mother, and she had been good to me for years. I couldn't leave her to die in squalor. Mine and Shane's dreams of me going to college once I graduated high school evaporated. Yet Shane remained optimistic. It's one thing that never ceased to amaze me about him. All those years he spent grinding when I was younger, all throughout his trial, and even throughout his time in prison, he always kept a positive outlook, always wore a smile. Better times were just around the corner in his mind, and he continued to encourage me in every one of our conversations that we'd figure it all out someday. But I knew he was having a hard time with his sentence. He wanted desperately to get out to help me and mom, and his living conditions were awful. He tried his best to hide it, but he looked sickly whenever I saw him, and often bore the marks of having been in fights. The little food that he did receive made him ill, and he mentioned that he sometimes had to sleep on the floor if they ran out of bunks. My brother had just been trying to make us a little extra money to improve our lives, and now he was suffering for it, and maybe would be for the rest of his life. Then, a few months ago, he called me, and was far more excited to talk than usual. He told me he'd been selected as a potential candidate for the prison's new early release program. At the time, he had 20 years left before he'd be eligible for parole, but if he agreed to participate, they'd set him free right away. As it was a new process, there'd be some additional oversight on his time outside, and if things weren't going well, he could still be brought back in. But it was a chance. That sounds way too good to be true, I said. What's the catch? Well, they said I'd have to undergo an experimental procedure. Called it being ethically altered. Cutting edge science, they say though. Apparently, it removes your criminal tendencies or something and can guarantee that you'll never commit another crime. But the beauty is, I haven't really got any criminal tendencies in the first place, so it shouldn't do anything to me. He was speaking so quickly, I barely caught it all. I was hesitant. I don't know, Shane. I don't like the idea of you being used like some kind of lab rat. And what do you mean, ethically altered? That sounds... 
I don't know. Is it like a surgery they want to do on your brain? Yeah, I know it sounds a little off, but it's just the term the prison probably came up with to make it sound nice for the people outside. Anyway, they said no surgery, no drugs. They won't tell me exactly what the process is. Guess it's top secret stuff, but apparently there's nothing physically invasive about it. My guess is they're going to strap me into a chair or something and put a helmet on me that'll pulse some kind of waves through my brain and try to rewrite it to be more docile. The thinking that he might undergo a procedure that would potentially alter his brain. He was sounding remarkably nonchalant. Dude, that sounds super sketchy. If they won't tell you what exactly they're going to do to you, what if it messes up your brain? What if it kills you? I was growing less convinced that the idea was good with every word. It won't kill me. They gave me a guarantee of that. Yes, they said it would change me, but, but like I said, they were talking about removing my criminal tendencies. And you know that I'm not really a serious criminal or anything. Look, this is an opportunity for us, Jack. Ten minutes. That's how long they said the whole process takes. Ten minutes, and I'm back with you and mom. Ten minutes, and we can get our lives back on track. I can get a job, and we can save up money again. You'll go to college. It'll be just like we planned. Mom will probably even get out of a downward spiral and start helping out again. His last few sentences made me realize that he hadn't been calling to ask for my opinion on his participation in the program. You've already signed up, haven't you? I asked him. I... He paused. I love you, little brother. The line went dead. I didn't hear from him again after that. He normally called once every few days, but the phone didn't ring for a week. When I got a day off work, I drove up to the prison to see him in person, but I was told that I couldn't. He was apparently sick and in the infirmary. I told them that he'd been talking about participating in the new early release program and asked if his illness was related to that. They told me that he just had the flu. However, they also said that there was no new early release program that they are aware of. Leaving them with a message to have him call me as soon as he was feeling better, I went home with a pit in my stomach. Something was wrong. In all the years he'd been inside, Shane and I had never gone this long without speaking. Sure, he'd gotten very sick a few times, but he always called before heading to the infirmary to let me know he might be out of touch for a little while. Why hadn't they known about the early release program? Were they lying? Did something go wrong with the process and they were trying to cover it up? Or had it really been so top secret that not everyone in the prison was privy to the information? In any case, I knew all I could do for the time was wait. Another week passed without a call, and I made another trip to the prison, where I received the same story. He was still sick, and I couldn't see him. I was more forceful this time, and demanded that they let me visit him in the infirmary if he was really that ill. They told me that that would be impossible. It wasn't until they threatened to escort me out physically, and not allow me back for future visits, that I finally capitulated and left of my own accord. After the third week with no word from Shane, I was convinced that something terrible had happened to him and the prison was trying to hide it. I called up there so much asking for information on him or his program that they blocked my number and I was on the brink of writing directly to the government when my phone rang. It wasn't Shane. It was someone from the prison informing me that we could come pick him up the next day. He was being released on parole. That was it. I started to try to reply with questions, 
they cut me off saying, You'll be available at noon, before hanging up on me. I couldn't believe it. Three weeks of radio silence, and now, suddenly, he was getting let out. They were really letting him go. I was going to have my brother back. But any excitement of mine at having him returned was tempered with wondering what state he'd be in when we brought him home. They had put him away believing that he had potentially had a large part in planning the murder of an innocent man and woman, one of them being a member of law enforcement. What had they done to him that made them so convinced he was no longer a danger to society? I only needed to wait until we picked him up the following day to understand why they weren't worried about him anymore. Shane had been right about one thing. Mom was different with the prospect of him coming home. She only had half her normal morning helping of vodka and actually ironed her clothes, although her hands were shaking so badly as she did it that it didn't help much. We even had our first real conversation in years about how things were going to be okay now that he was coming back. Yet, when we saw him, we quickly realized that it wasn't going to be the homecoming we'd hoped for. Shane was different. The smile that he always wore was gone. In fact, all the life that normally filled his face seemed to be missing. He wore a vacant expression and stared into the distance as if he recognized nothing in front of him. When I called his name, he turned to face me, but it was as if he only did it because he recognized the word Shane and not his brother's voice. I wrapped him up in a hug and asked him if he was okay, told him how happy I was to see him and that he was free. He didn't hug me back. His arms lay stiff at his sides. Shane had always been a big hugger, especially with me, and I'd expected that on his first day of freedom. He'd give me a huge squeeze. I got nothing. Pulling back, I grew worried. Shane, what the hell? Are you okay? What did they do to you? I shook him slightly as I asked. I feel okay, he responded so mechanically that I could scarcely recognize his voice from the AI ones that I used for voiceovers. Just when I was about to begin screaming at the guards that were helping escort him to explain what was wrong with him, a thin, dark-haired woman in a lab coat approached us and introduced herself as Dr. Kosick, head of the new program. Are you Shane's brother? She asked. He listed you as his post-release guardian. Yeah, I am. What the hell did you do to him? I snapped at her. She considered me coolly. Your brother is one of the first people to undergo a revolutionary new process that is going to change the way we handle criminal justice in this country. No longer will we need to lock away the worst members of our society forever we'll be able to give them the alteration and they'll be able to rejoin the rest of us. You should be proud of him, she said with an air of condescension. That's not my brother. I didn't like her superior attitude. Shane has never stood still for more than 10 seconds in my entire life. Look at him. Shane hadn't moved an inch with a guard that was escorting him stopped when we walked up. He looked over towards me and Dr. Kosick whenever he heard the word Shane, but then, realizing we weren't speaking directly to him, turned his head straight forward again and stared blankly into space. You need to lower your voice. She bore an expression of annoyance. I understand that the effects of the process may be shocking at first, but you'll see in time that he's better off this way. You have to remember that your brother committed a heinous crime 
and likely would have done something similar in the future had we let him out via the normal practice. In any case, the effects cannot be reversed. What we need to discuss now is the path forward. Screw you, lady. I was seething. You don't know anything about him. He was innocent. He was a good man. And what do you mean the effects can't be reversed? You change him back. Change him back right now. I don't care if he sits in here for the rest of his life. At least he'll be himself. She was starting to mark some things off on a clipboard, and I could tell was only half listening to me. Looking up, she began. Again, the process is irreversible, and you'll find that your brother signed a binding agreement to participate in this trial. He's been evaluated over the last several weeks by medical staff and government officials, and everyone is on board with moving forward with phase two, public reintroduction. At this point, you have two options. Option one, you can sign this, and you'll get to take your brother home. For the first month, you will call me daily to discuss how he's doing, and we will make periodic home visits to inspect in person. We'll help him get work so he can start contributing to society again like a law-abiding citizen. You will not disclose anything about this process to anyone, and if anyone should ask how he got out early or why he's acting so differently, you'll say that he's been reformed and he was released early due to good behavior and overcrowding. Any violation of these terms and he'll be brought right back here and you will lose all future visitation privileges. Option two, you don't sign this and we take your brother back inside right now and you'll lose all future visitation privileges and before you start spouting off legality or suing us or anything of that nature. She could obviously see the fury in my eyes. You should know that we have the backing from the highest levels. Your case would go nowhere. Now, if you could hurry up and make your decision, please. I have several more of these to do today. She returned to a clipboard. I was shaking with anger, clearly to her. Shane was nothing more than a variable in her experiment. He wasn't a person, a brother, a friend, a human at all. Just a note on a clipboard, an alteration for her to study. But what choice did I have? She had all the power, and she knew it. If I fought her or refused, she'd take Shane away, and I'd never see him again. And... If he'd been living poorly before, it would be nothing to how I imagined him living inside now, sitting on his bed day in and day out, wasting away with that blank stare on his face. Wrenching the clipboard from her hands, I signed the agreement. We rode home in near silence. Both mom and I tried to ask Shane questions about the process he underwent, but all he could tell us was, I don't remember. I was just about to ask him what he did remember, to see if he even really knew who we were, when he abruptly announced, I'm tired, I need to sleep. Again, his voice had no emotion behind it. It sounded as if a computer was reading off lines from code. Wondering now if they turned him into some sort of cyborg, I looked in the rear view, half expecting to see red eyes staring back at me. But I was surprised to find he'd already fallen asleep. Instantly, as soon as he'd said it, he went to sleep. Like it was the next line in a command string. I made a plan to go over his entire body with a metal detecting wand that I had at home from one of my security jobs as soon as we got through the door. When we arrived at the apartment complex and parked the car, he was still snoring. I had to open the back door and shake him slightly to wake him. In the past, when I'd woken him from a deep slumber, he'd always been a little grumpy. It was the only time I was cautious around him. On instinct, I stood slightly back as he opened his eyes, awaiting a tirade of frustration 
and asking for five more minutes, but he just stared straight ahead again. Shane? I said his name. He turned to look at me, but didn't reply. Hey, we're home. You can get out of the car now and we can go inside. I wondered how much of his behavior was due to the alteration, or how much might be due to him having been in prison for ten years and always having to be told what to do. Okay. His vocal cords made the sound, but it's hard to describe. It wasn't his voice. I know that doesn't make much sense, but I've heard that voice for 24 years. I know the quality the cadence, the inflection. It just wasn't his. Mom had already given up. She started crying in the drive home, and the minute we parked, she'd run upstairs. I knew to go hit the bottle, or maybe something stronger. Shane exited the car, and I closed the door behind him. Surprisingly, he started walking towards the elevators, like he knew where he was going. I decided not to say anything and see if he remembered where he lived. He hit the up button as he should have and selected the correct floor once he was inside. When we exited on our floor, he made a direct line for our unit. I followed him closely and watched as he opened the door, just as he'd done hundreds of times before. However, he stopped right after stepping through the threshold and stood stock still again. I nearly crashed into him. He seemed to be waiting on the next set of instructions, so I told him to go sit at the kitchen table for now. Okay, the voice came again. Just as I'd planned to do on the drive back, I ran my wand over his body and found he had no metal inside of him. I felt his head for signs of stitching or scarring and discovered nothing. I checked every inch of exposed skin for surgical markings, but at least to my untrained eye, he was clean. The entire time I did my examination, Shane didn't move, nor did his expression change. A blank stare just fixated on the wall in front of him, and I got the impression I could do nearly anything to him and he wouldn't respond. I sat down at the table across from him and started asking the questions that I'd wanted to ask in the car. Hey Shane? His eyes met mine, and it was only then that we were sitting down and I was looking directly into them that I truly saw that there was nothing behind them. Whatever it was that made Shane Shane was gone. I was looking only at a collection of cells a biological mass that could walk and talk, but had no personality, had no life. It terrified me. My voice quivered as I asked, Shane, do you, do you remember your full name? Yes. What is it? Shane Theodore Thompson. It was like he was recalling a date stored away in a hard drive. Do you know who I am? Yes. Who am I to you? And what is my full name? You are my brother, Jack Francis Thompson. How old are we? I am 36 and you are 24. I was happy to see that he at least knew who he was and who I was. But this was all information they could have had him memorize at the prison. I wanted to ask something more personal to see if he really had all of Shane's memories. Who did you lose your virginity to and where did it happen? Elise Sherman and in a parent's basement. Now this story was one that Shane and I laughed about often. Elise's father had come downstairs while they were in the middle of the deed and he chased Shane out of the house with Shane's pants around his ankles. It awoke in the neighbors and several of them got an eyeful of Shane's business while he desperately tried to pull his pants up and dive back into his car. 
but this time, he relayed the information with no humour, no crack of a smile, remembering the absurdity of it all. The information was there, in his head, but it was as if he had no connection to it. I realised that they hadn't removed his criminal tendencies as they told him they were going to do. They'd removed him. I don't know how they did it, and at the time, I still wasn't sure what they'd done, but I knew that he wasn't there anymore. Shane's body was sitting right in front of me, but my brother had died somewhere in that prison. Over the next several weeks, I kept my agreement with Dr. Kosick. I called her daily and informed her of how things were progressing with Shane. There weren't really any changes to report. As she stated they would, they helped him secure a job at a local grocery store and she checked in on him in person twice. She couldn't have been more delighted with the success of her program. If you could really call it that, I surely didn't. Yes, Shane hadn't committed any crimes and seemed highly unlikely to ever do so, but Shane also hadn't done much of anything. He was operating on what I would have called pure animal instinct, outside of being given direct instructions. When he was hungry, he ate. Thirsty, he drank. When he needed to use the restroom or sleep, he did that as well. But beyond that, I had to tell him to do anything. Shower, brush his teeth, get dressed, go to work. At the grocery store, he had to be given specific tasks by his boss, and he was able to perform them perfectly. But he took no initiative beyond doing exactly what he was told to do. And that's what it seemed our lives would be from then on. Shane had given so much of his life for me, sacrificed his entire future. I didn't mind helping him for once, and decided that I would continue to support him in this state until the day that one of us died. But then, last week, something changed. Shane and I share a bedroom, and I awoke around 3am to an odd scratching sound. We are no strangers to rats on our building, but this was different. It was coming from near Shane's bed. I walked over to investigate, using my cell phone light to check for vermin. I couldn't find anything. And, as I approached, the noise simply stopped. Too tired to care much, I went back to sleep with plans to look into it in the morning. Yet in the morning, those plans were driven straight out of my mind. It was the smell of bacon that woke me the second time and I opened my eyes in confusion. Mom hadn't gotten up to make breakfast in years and Shane hadn't cooked anything since his return. He just ate pre-made meals or leftovers from the fridge. Rolling over, I saw that Shane's bed was empty and I sat up quickly in astonishment. I'd had to tell him to get out of bed every morning since he came back. What was going on? Then, I heard it. Laughter. Shane's laughter drifted through the doorway. Him and Mom were having an animated conversation in the kitchen. I heard my name through the cackles. Leary-eyed, I walked in to join them and saw that Shane was at the stove, happily frying up breakfast, while Mom was at the table smiling and having a cigarette. Speak of the devil, Mum said, and Shane spun around. He ran over to me, spatula still in hand, and wrapped me in a massive hug. Stunned, I only feebly returned it as he said, Good morning, little brother. So glad you're awake. We were just talking about the time you tried to make me a birthday cake, and you mix up the salt and the sugar. He started laughing hard and pulled back. I was at a loss for words. He was acting just like his old self. Was I dreaming? As he tried to step back towards the stove, I grabbed his face with both my hands and looked directly into his eyes. 
there was life there again. But still, there was something off about them. A darkness I didn't remember from before. There was a sudden flash of black and I leapt back, gasping. What's the matter, Jack? Still shocked about how much better looking I am than you. He laughed some more and went back to his cooking. It was a trick of the light, I told myself. Just be happy, he's acting like himself again. Maybe after a few weeks the effects lessen or something. But I couldn't shake the feeling that there was a coldness in Shane's laughter that hadn't been there before. Whatever my reservations, we had the best family breakfast we'd had since Shane was put away. We reminisced about old times, talked about our future. I nearly cried at how happy I was to have my brother truly returned. After he left for work, I called Dr. Cossack to give my update, and I debated whether to tell her the truth. Shane's behavioral change was positive in my view, but she might not see it the same way. Maybe she'd want to take him back and do the process over again. But the first words out of her mouth when she picked up were, Is he acting differently today? She sounded anxious. Her tone made me nervous. Maybe something had gone wrong with some of the other participants. Um, yeah, yeah, he was acting like his old self this morning. He even got up and made breakfast, I replied. Did you notice anything strange about him? How did she know? Nothing serious. I just thought there was a kind of... I don't know. His eyes looked different. What's going on? Damn, I'm just... Just hang on tight. I'll come out and check in on him tomorrow. And she suddenly hung up. My heart was hammering. She knew something. She'd been expecting exactly what I told her. I tried to call her back, but he went straight to voicemail. For the rest of the day, I tried to act as normally as possible, just as she'd instructed. I went to work myself, but had a hard time concentrating. I wondered how Shane would be that evening. But when he returned from his shift, he did so with a bag full of groceries in his arms and announced loudly that he was going to make us a five-star meal. Seeing his smiling face pushed my concerns down, and I chalked Dr. Cossack's behavior up to her process possibly failing. Maybe whatever she'd done had reversed itself, and she was not, in fact, going to revolutionize criminal justice in this country. With that thought, I wondered if this might be the last night I have with my brother before they hauled him back to prison to do more tests or simply lock him away again. I decided, if that was the case, that I should stop my worrying and just enjoy the evening with my family. We ate, we drank, we laughed, we sang. It was a perfect night. Until we fell asleep. I awoke again around 3am. The scratching had returned, louder this time, and I looked over towards Shane's bed. Damn, I whisper yelled as I sat up and slid back towards the wall. Shane was sitting bolt upright in his bed with his feet down on the floor. He was glaring at me. There was a malevolent grin on his face illuminated by the digital clock on his nightstand. The hell are you doing, man? I yelped. There was something about his presence. It was dark and heavy. It made the air around me oppressive, and I was struggling to get full breaths in. He didn't reply. Just kept watching me. His eyes were cold, and as I stared into them, I caught movement behind him. A shadow was crawling across his wall. A shadow with red eyes and long, spindly fingers. He opened his mouth, and a voice... Voices? 
that I did not recognize emanated from it. Shh, go back to sleep, little brother. There was no love behind the words. It was malice. It was evil. My eyelids sagged and I collapsed back onto the bed. I tried to fight it, but exhaustion overcame me and I fell back into a deep sleep. The next day, I didn't wake up until noon. Shane had already left for work and I had six missed calls and a flurry of texts from my manager asking why I hadn't shown up for my shift. I played the events of the night before back in my mind and tried to tell myself it was a dream, but there was no way it could be real. But when I looked over at Shane's bed, I saw there were deep gouges in the wall behind it. Gouges that looked like they'd been made by massive, clawed hands. Something clicked into place. I formed a theory on what they'd done to Shane at the prison. I think... They removed... His soul. I don't know how they did it. I don't know if it was magic or if it was science. But I think the soul that had inhabited Shane's body... The very thing that made him who he was had been ripped out. Dr. Cossack never showed up for a visit and she stopped answering my calls. When I contacted the prison directly, they said that Dr. Cossack had never worked there and told me there was no record of a Shane Theodore Thompson even serving time at the facility. They've abandoned us. They're trying to cover this up. He's getting worse by the day. He can move things without touching them. I've heard him speak in languages I can't understand. I'm sure this is happening to more of them that went through the process. To more of them that they ethically altered. Because. I don't think they considered. That if they removed the souls that inhabited these people. They left them open to be inhabited by something else.